Good evening, yeah. and welcome. Uh, I want to be uh, say a word of thanks to the Eucharistic Revival Committee of the Parish for setting this up tonight. I want to thank Todd Waltz for all the AV uh, equipment. Um, just to uh, play an audible here, uh, tomorrow we were going to meet from 6 to 7, but at 7 p.m. is the rosary for Keith Sutton. Um, so I'm going to do the 5 o'clock Mass. Uh, that'll end around 5.25 or so. So let's, let's meet at 5.40. Uh, let's say 5.40, that way if people want to go to the rosary, they can make it in, in time. Um, so that'll be 5.40, 5.45 tomorrow, tomorrow evening. Let's pray for Keith and his uh, repose. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And let us pray part of this uh, prayer, a beautiful prayer for the Eucharistic Revival. Lord Jesus Christ, you give us your flesh and blood for the life of the world, and we desire that all people come to the supper of the sacrifice of the Lamb. Renew in your church the truth and the beauty and the goodness contained in the most blessed Eucharist. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, well, welcome everyone. I'm so glad you're here. This is a timeshare presentation, and after tonight, you're eligible for a free toaster. <laughs> Exclusions do apply, though. No, now that's the only joke I have the entire evening. I, I don't have any witty stories, so have lots of caffeine and sugar in your system. Uh, this is going to be more of an academic presentation, and I did prepare three nights, and so this first night is more of general introduction, a general overview of what sacred scripture is and the role it plays in our, in our Christian lives, and how it then uh, shapes and informs how we celebrate uh, the Eucharist. Tomorrow night is going to get into some really beautiful passages of Scripture, some really beautiful, profound theology, especially from Matthew's Gospel and John's Gospel. And then Friday night we'll conclude by looking at a few more Scripture passages, um, as well as uh, sort of the, the theology of the Mass itself as we celebrate it uh, today. It's good that we're doing this. It's good that we have this Eucharistic revival. It's good that we are learning more about our faith. It was St. Anselm of Canterbury, a uh, Benedictine monk there in England, who said that theology is fides quadens intellectum. It's faith, it's seeking understanding. So we have faith in our hearts, and we desire to have a greater understanding of what it is. Uh, we have some Christians who have lots of faith, uh, but they don't really seek out understanding. And then, of course, we have our secular atheistic society that only focuses on the, the reason, the rationality, that doesn't have any faith. And so we want to hold those two together, uh, faith in our hearts and also the intellectual life of our beautiful uh, tradition. So what I want to do is, I, again, I want to walk through and give a broad introduction of sacred scripture and our understanding of it and how it informs how we understand and celebrate the Eucharist. And what I've given to you tonight is a handout. Don't say I never gave you anything. There you go. Merry Christmas. A free gift. Uh, we have a handout here from Dei Verbum. Now, Dei Verbum is a Vatican II document that was published in November of 1965. And it was the Second Vatican Council's um, statement on our understanding of Scripture. And what I've given to you are sections 11, 12, and 13, and I invite you to read that uh, on your own. But this is a beautiful document that gets us to a good start here of our understanding of Scripture. The first thing that we want to point out is that in Dei Verbum, we're told that Scripture is both sacred and canonical. Sacred and canonical. So sacred comes from the Latin sanctuary, which means to fence off. So we have our parish cemeteries, and there is a fence. And there's a sense that this is a sacred place. You don't smoke a cigar in the cemetery. You don't go jogging in a cemetery. Uh, in South Bend, there's Riverside uh, Cemetery, where Newt Rockney, the great football coach, who invented the forward pass at Notre Dame, is buried. And on football weekends, guys will leave six packs of beer. 
Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I think that's their attempt to, to show appreciation, but it's a, it's a little borderline. I'm not sure if it's respecting the sacredness of the cemetery. A church building is sacred because it's been dedicated for God's worship, God's glory. It's not a mall, it's not a post office, it's not a shopping center. It's a church, it's for God's glory, it pertains directly to God, and so it is something that is, is sacred. A church, a temple, etc. And this is very important that the Second Vatican Council reminds us that we understand Scripture to be sacred. Because we want to say that the Bible is of God. It's not William Shakespeare, it's not fiction, it's not the Star Wars, it's not Lord of the Rings, it's not World War II history, but this is the Word of God. It's a special book, it's sacred, it pertains directly to God. Now, the next term that the document gives us, de verbo, is that Scripture is canonical. It's canonical, meaning it's part of a canon, it's part of a list, it's part of an ordering. So we have in the church the code of canon law because it's the church's laws, it's canons, one by one listed out all the church rules and regulations. And so what this term is emphasizing is that a determination had to be made. What this is emphasizing is that the Bible did not just come out of the sky. What this means is that over two to three to four hundred years, decisions had to be made, discernment had to be done, to determine what's going to be in the Bible and what's not going to be in the Bible. So you can see how these sort of form two ends of two extremes. On the one hand, we say that the Bible is sacred, it's of God, but on the other hand, we want to say that it's the work of human hands. It's both and. And so over the first 300, 350 years of Christianity, a list had to be made, a canon had to be formed. And the church decided that there would be 27 books in the New Testament. And you have to step back and think and ask yourself, well, why not just seven books? Why not 27? Why not 37? Why not 107? Why these 27? Determinations had to be made. Some things had to be included. Some things had to be excluded. So, for example, we have the four canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but there were some Gospels in the ancient world that were not included. The Gospel of St. James, it's a beautiful text. It talks about the childhood of Mary. It talks about Anna and Joachim, the grandparents of Jesus. But it's not included in the New Testament. You also have the Gospel of St. Thomas. There's a pretty clear reason why the Gospel of St. Thomas was not included in the New Testament. Because there's a scene where little boy Jesus is walking on the playground. Do, 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 do. Another little boy hits him in the shoulder, and Jesus turns around and kills him. Then he brings him back to life. The early church said, no, we don't believe that that's part of the canon. We don't believe that's part of our revelation of tradition. The book of Revelation was debated for a few centuries whether to be included in the New Testament or not. Some people said absolutely it should be included in the New Testament. It's so beautiful, it's rich symbolism, it's mysticism, the great imagery it gives us. And others said, no, it's a bad acid trip. Someone has been smoking too much wacky tobacco. We can't include that book in the New Testament. But it was eventually included. Then you had Marcion. Marcion, Marcion was an early a church figure who said that the God is revealed by Jesus Christ is a very different God than the God of the Hebrew Old Testament Scriptures. But the God of the Hebrew Old Testament Scriptures is mean, angry, and kills people with floods and earthquakes. But the God of Jesus Christ is loving and merciful. So we're not going to read from the Old Testament. And the church had to say to Marcion, no, we condemn you. We are going to read from the Hebrew Scriptures, the Jewish Scriptures, and we're going to read from the New Testament because it's one big story. So my brothers and sisters, what I'm trying to say here is that by saying that the Bible is sacred and canonical, the church is trying to stand in the middle and hold in tension two truths. On the one hand, the Bible is the Word of God. On the other hand, it's the work of human hands that both are true. That the Bible did not just come out of the sky one day floating down on a feather pillow, 
But on the other hand, it's not fiction. It's not the same as Harry Potter or Star Wars. That it is sacred, it is of God, but it is formed and brought together because of the work of human beings. And this is very important as we think about the Eucharist. Because the Eucharist is given to us by Christ Jesus, but its shape and particulars is also the work of human hands. So, let's look at the four Gospels as an example of how these Gospels are both sacred, they're of God, but also that they are the work of humans. So here we have in the center Christ on the cross, and we have in the, uh, the corners, we have these four figures that come to us from Ezekiel and from Daniel and from the book of Revelation. I think it was St. Irenaeus who said that these four creatures in heaven represent the four evangelists. And so the top right, you have the eagle representing John, because John's theology is high, high theology, like an eagle soaring high. In John's gospel, Jesus is very much a divine figure. He is God, who is present before time existed. Jesus is in complete control. He knows everything. He knows how many men the woman at the well has been with. He's in complete control. Even when he dies, he says, Consumatum est. It is consummated. It is finished. And he bows his head. So even in death, he's in complete control. So John is the eagle. Matthew, in the top left corner, we thought was written first. Most scripture scholars believe Mark was written first. But it's in Matthew's gospel. There's a genealogy, just like in Luke. And so Matthew is, is depicted as a human because of that genealogy, the human family tree. Mark uh, is associated with Alexandria in Egypt, and the, uh, the image of the lion, so he's always associated with the lion, and then on the bottom right is the ox, because in Luke's gospel there are the ox and the ass present in the stable at the birth of Jesus. Now what you notice here is that you have these four evangelists in the four corners, and at the center is Jesus Christ. And one thing I want us to understand is that no one gospel completely encapsulates, completely understands, can completely explain the mystery, the beauty, and the power of Jesus Christ. No one gospel can do that. So for example, Mark gives us his understanding of who Jesus is. John gives his understanding. Luke and then uh, 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 Matthew give theirs as well. If I were to ask you uh, here uh, tonight to to write an essay, or everyone, if our homework is to write an essay about my dad, Ron Wirtz, some of you would write an essay about his home life as a father and as a husband, some of you would write about his professional career as a CPA, as a banker, some would write about his spiritual life and his baptism and the sacraments he received, but no one essay is going to completely encapsulate him and capture him. Rather, we need to have with the four Gospels sort of a kaleidoscope. Each Gospel writer is having a different perspective of who Jesus is. So in Mark's Gospel, there is no baby Jesus. There is no birth narrative. It begins with an adult Jesus, with an adult John the Baptist. But Matthew says, no, let's talk about the birth of Jesus, and then have an adult John the Baptist. And Luke says, well, let's talk about the baby Jesus and baby John the Baptist. And John says, you're all nuts. That's not good enough. We have to go back all the way billions of years ago before time existed. That Jesus is the word of God. So all four Gospels have different perspectives about who Jesus is. And what we do as Christians is we take all four Gospels... And we put all the truths and the goodness and the insights, and we put them together as a composite, as a beautiful kaleidoscope that reveals to us the person of Jesus Christ and reveals to us the mystery, the goodness, and the power of the Eucharist. So, a small example in John's Gospel, the Last Supper is likely not a Passover meal. It's a meal that's before the Passover meal. Before Mark and Matthew and Luke, it is a Passover meal. We'll get into that tomorrow night or perhaps on Friday night as well. The point here is that all four of these evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are giving us powerful, beautiful, truthful insights into who Jesus is. And they're doing it because they're humans 
And they are giving us their perspective of what we need to know. And doing so by working through the grace of Jesus Christ. So I want to give you some examples. Again, the big picture here is that these Gospels are both sacred, they're directly from God, but they're through the work of human hands. So I want us to give us some examples here. Here is a beautiful icon of St. Luke. Tradition says that Luke himself was a painter, an iconographer. So here he is painting an image with Mary with child, because it's only in Luke's Gospel with the Annunciation, and so in Luke's Gospel with the, we have the Magnificat, and Mary plays such a prominent role in Luke's Gospel. And so he's painting, he's drawing, he's writing an icon of Mary with the, uh, the child Jesus. And notice here, next to Luke, right, very close proximity, very intimate, is this angel. It's this divine being. And the angel here is whispering into the ears of, of Luke and pointing and directing his hand of what to paint. And so the theology of this icon is to say that Luke is writing his gospel, but he's doing so with pretty very direct influence, very divine direct influence. But this is very much a sacred work uh, that is uh, being written. Here we have Matthew, the bottom, in Citi Sancti Evangelii Secundo Matteo. So this is the beginning of the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. This looks to be like early Renaissance in the 12, 1300s. And so you have Matthew here sitting at his desk, and you have this angel figure here with a book, and it looks to me as if Matthew is just copy and pasting. <laughs> the angel is giving, giving to Matthew exactly what he's to write down, and so he's dipping his uh, quill into the ink and he's writing it down. And so it's a very direct, very direct influence upon the gospel. So again, it's very much emphasizing the sacred nature of Matthew's gospel. This is also Matthew. This is by Caravaggio. So if you go into Rome, if you go to the church of San Luigi de Francese, uh, you have three uh, paintings by Caravaggio showing the life of Matthew, his calling, his writing of the gospel, and his death. And this is the center panel. This is the writing of his gospel. Again, we have this angelic being, a very divine being, and he seems to be dictating, speaking to Matthew. He's using these hand gestures, you need to write this, and to write this, and be sure to include this, and don't forget that. And notice where Matthew is, is focused on, he's looking upward here, right? He's not really focused on this pen, he's looking up. So here again, the emphasis in this beautiful painting from the 1600s by Caravaggio is this divine uh, inspiration, the sacred nature of scripture. Now here is St. Luke. We know it's St. Luke. Uh, I don't read the acrylic here, but here we have Luke uh, with the oxen, and he's always uh, associated with the ox, as I mentioned earlier. And now this one is a bit more balanced, because even though there's this sort of heavenly figure that heaven is opened up, and what Luke is doing is, is an act that's very sacred, it's prayerful, Luke here at this point is very much focused right, on his writing. He's very much focused on his work and on these blank pages, and he's about to write this. So this is emphasizing a little bit more that the Gospels are the work of human hands, of human beings. Now this is my favorite, because of this motif or this theme of sacred art, this one is, is, is quite typical. We have three things going on here. In the top right, we have the hand of God coming out of the clouds, the clouds represent the mystery of God. The clouds represent that this is something that we can't fully understand. And it almost kind of looks like a Monty Python movie, doesn't it? The, the, the hand of God coming out from the clouds. And God is directing Mark what to do. We know it's Mark because he has the lion here and he's resting his book. Uh, the second thing we have is he's got his ink pen, he's got his book. Uh, which isn't quite accurate. He would not have had a book in the first century. He would have had a scroll, a uh, papyrus scroll. But anyway, he has his book, he's got his uh, quill, and he's got his ink. And then what we have is we have Mark himself. And so what I love about this icon is there really is a direct line between God dictating and Mark, whose focus, his eyes are on God, and then what Mark is writing. 
And so I love this because this is, this again, this summarizes so well all these icons we've looked at so far. It's emphasizing the sacred. Basically, it's God dictating, like a boss who dictates a letter and the secretary types the letter on behalf of the boss. The boss speaks and dictates. And then you write down here, Mark is writing down what the boss God is saying. The problem with these icons, including this one, is while it's beautiful and there's a lot of truth to it, they're not completely accurate. Rather, what's emphasized here is the divine reality, the sacred reality of Scripture. But what I want us to also be mindful of, and this is what Dei Verbum 11 through 13 is also emphasizing, is that the Bible is also the work of human hands. So here we have Mark, and what is missing? His brain. That's a brain. That's my, that's my attempt at drawing. That's a brain. And he's got his brain. Mark is the one who decided to start with an adult Jesus with an adult John the Baptist. He's not going to have a birth narrative. Eh. Mark, who's Greek, it's all written in Koine Greek, his Koine, his Koine Greek is quite poor. It's very limited. He repeats the same words over and over again. His vocabulary is limited. First year Greek students love to study Mark because it's so easy compared to Luke or compared to John. And that's because he was limited in the Greek that he knew. Mark could have been the interpreter of St. Peter when St. Peter leaves Jerusalem and goes to uh, Rome. And so Mark knows a little bit of Greek, he knows a little bit of Aramaic, he knows a little bit of Latin. But it's in Mark's Gospel where anytime he gives us a Hebrew word, an Aramaic word, he translates it for us. Apata. Parentheses. That means be open. Or, uh, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mark has to translate that for us. Why? Because Mark is writing for an audience in Rome that doesn't speak Hebrew. But when Mark writes a Roman Latin term, such as centurion, he doesn't translate it for you. He just assumes that you know that a centurion means a Roman officer who has a hundred, a century, centurion, men under his command. That's because of who Mark is. That's because God is not dictating word for word to Mark. It's because Mark has certain skills and certain limitations. Same thing with Matthew. It's only in Matthew's gospel that Mary and Joseph and Jesus flee into Egypt. No other gospel mentions that. Why? Because as we'll see tomorrow night, it's very important that Matthew associates Jesus with Moses. And where did Moses go? To free the people? Into Egypt. And you think about it, they're fleeing Herod, the Holy Family is fleeing Herod. Why didn't they go to Italy and have some pasta? Or why did they go to the Greek islands? You ever seen the Greek islands and that beautiful blue crystal water? Why Egypt? No offense to Egyptians, but why Egypt of all places? Because Matthew wants you to associate Jesus with Moses who went into Egypt. That's because of the mind and the brain of Matthew. And Matthew's genealogy goes all the way to Abraham. Jesus' genealogy, Matthew, goes all the way to Abraham. But Luke's genealogy goes all the way to Adam. Why? Because Luke wants to emphasize that all humanity is saved. Whereas Matthew wants to focus on how the Jewish people are being saved. My point here is to emphasize that the Bible is both sacred and it's canonical. That God is the author of Scripture, it's His Word, but it's through the work of humans. We humans who have our limits, we who can only do so much, we have our certain experiences. And so in Dei Verbum, again the handout I gave you tonight, in Dei Verbum 11 through 13, it makes it very clear that God is the author. God is the author. Actor in the Latin, where we get authority. That these are the words of God in sacred scripture that we're going to study the next few nights. But human beings are also authors, they write it down, but we can think of them as the composers. That they have been inspired by God, but they're going to compose these beautiful truths. That Matthew is going to include a genealogy, he's going to include the story of Egypt. Mark's going to skip that, and he's going to focus on the adult Jesus, getting baptized, being tempted, and starting his ministry right away. And then we would say, well, how can we trust 
How can we trust that this is the word of God? How can we trust that this isn't just fiction? And the church would say, well, we have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit works as sort of an insurance agent, giving us an insurance policy that if God wants you to know something, he's going to make sure you know it. And so this is important for us to understand, because as we study the scriptural roots of the Eucharist, we have to understand that this is what God desires for us. But the specifics of the Eucharist, bread and wine, certain words, that's because we're human, and the Eucharist is part of the work of human hands. Are you guys with me? Are you bored? Oh, this is boring. Okay. All right. Too bad. Offered up for the poor souls. Sorry. Okay. So, let's continue with David Barrow, because there's something very beautiful, very beautiful here in paragraphs 11 through 13. In sacred scripture, therefore, while the truth and the holiness of God always remains intact, the marvelous condescension of eternal wisdom is clearly shown, that we may learn the gentle kindness of God, which words cannot express, and how far he has gone in adapting his language with thoughtful concern for our weak human nature. That's a quote from St. John Chrysostom. For the words of God expressed in human language, Koine Greek and now English through translation, had been made like human discourse, just as the word of the Eternal Father, when he took to himself the flesh of human weakness, was in every way made like men. It's a beautiful passage, beautiful theology, and it's great that we're studying this during the Christmas season, the Incarnation. God, who was present at the creation of the Son, is incarnated on our level as Jesus Christ, who's getting a sunburn. God, who's present at the creation of life, is now incarnated as Jesus Christ, and he's subject to death. He meets us at our level. And just as Christ Jesus is fully God and fully human, Scripture is of God and it's also of human. And so what's beautiful about this paragraph is the marvelous condescension. Marvelous condescension. When we think of condescension, we think that's always negative. Oh, Father Michael was so condescending to us. Oh, he was talking down to us. No, no, this is something good. This is the divine condescension. So you can see descent... And call with, he descends with, he comes down to our level in the incarnation, in Scripture, and in the Eucharist. This is very beautiful. This is reminding us that God is with us in our misery. He doesn't abandon us. Cardinal Avery Dulles, God rest his soul, says that humanity shares in the divine life, not in a divine, but in a human way consonantly with his nature as a man. Meaning, we're not angels. <laughs> surprise, surprise, sorry to break it to you. We're not angels. We're humans. We have language. And we're tactile. We're bodily. We have the five senses. And so God, we get to participate in God's divine life, not as angelic, pure spiritual beings, but as human beings, body and soul. So what does this mean practically? It means that Jesus chose to use sensible means to communicate himself to us. Images, societal structures, rituals, and language. Right, think about all the beautiful stories of Jesus. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar. Pay your taxes to him. Render to God what is God. He's using imagery of taxes because that's a human societal function during the Roman Empire occupying Jerusalem in the first century. He talks about bread, he talks about wine. Why? Because bread and wine is the staple of human life. He talks about sheep and about shepherds. I don't know much about sheep or shepherds, but I can kind of work around with this. People in the first century certainly could. He meets us at our level, right? He's there in our presence. He uses language and symbols and signs to meet us as part of the divine condescension to be at our level. And so the church for 2,000 years, continuing Jesus' ministry, also uses wine and bread and oil and water and voice and action and touch, community and gathering, the assembly, and also rituals. So let's talk about ritual. 
Because again, what I want you to see is that Jesus Christ in his incarnation is sacred and is the work of humanity, right? That God, Christ Jesus is fully God and fully human. The sacred scripture is very much sacred, but it's also canonical. We make choices. We had like, what was it, 16 uh, manuscripts of Mark? And they weren't all the same. Mark's gospel ends at chapter 16 pretty abruptly. In Mark 16, the women, they're, they're there Easter Sunday morning, and they see the empty tomb, and they're afraid, and they run off in fear. Boom! Lights out. End of the story. It's kind of a bad ending. <laughs> it's not they lived happily ever after. It just sort of abruptly ends. But there are some manuscripts of Mark in the original Greek that we have in our possession, and they add endings to it. So if you go home and look at your Bible, you'll probably see at the end of Mark chapter 16 alternative versions of endings. That's because some people, humans, in the first two or three or four centuries said, wow, what a bad ending. I'm going to make a better ending. Then this had to do, and then they add on to it. So the Bible is sacred. It's also human. Christ Jesus is fully God, fully human. And also our rituals, the Eucharist, sacred and canonical of God and of humanity. So what's a ritual? What is the Eucharist as a ritual? Because a ritual is a very broad term. And it's also part of this condescension. God made us to be ritual people. We're people of habits. We are. God knows that. He created us. <laughs> so of course he's going to give us ritual because we're people of ritual. A ritual basically is a repeatable pattern of human behavior. A repeatable pattern of human behavior. It can be individual. It can be communal. Every single person in this room or watching the live stream, you have your morning ritual. You get up, brush your teeth, you make coffee, use the restroom, you check your text message, whatever. You say a prayer for Father Michael because he really needs prayers. Right? You have your morning ritual. It's what you do. We're all part of rituals, and some are, are, are personal, like a bathroom ritual. Some rituals are very public. They can be secular. They can be religious. Think about going to a major league football, uh, baseball game. Think about going to the NFL, watching an NFL game, watching a bowl game, right? Think about the NFL. They give out awards and announcements. They bring out the team that won the Super Bowl in 1972, and everyone claps for them. Then they bring out the flag, and they have the national anthem, and everyone stands for the flag and the national anthem, and men take their hats off. Unless you kneel, unless you kneel at the national anthem, remember when that happens? Everyone's talking about the next day. Why is everyone talking about the next day? Because the ritual got broken up. We don't like that. Aside from the stance that the person is trying to make or protest, at a very basic level, we don't like that because ritual has been broken up. Something is going wrong. Remember there was a priest <laughs> at Notre Dame, and, and he would start Mass with the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. The Lord be with you. Oh, thank you so much. It drove me nuts. He, he, he acted as if he wasn't expecting you to say, and with your spirit. And it would drive me nuts. I'd say, it's a ritual, right? He was saying, with your spirit, oh, oh golly, geez, you guys are awesome. Thanks so much. No, buddy, it's a ritual. This is what we do. This is the mass. And it should be regular. It should be informed. So what we have here is that we have ritual as part of our human lives. It's who we are. It's at, it's at the very heart of who we are. The Eucharist is part of that ritual. We can think more about ritual as part of a, a certain formality to life, right? That grammar, think about grammar and language. I before E except after C. Is that correct? Is that the, that's formal language, right? We use a comma here and use a semicolon here. Certain ways of talking. Sports and games. You can't double dribble in basketball. You can't throw it, you can't target with your helmet and football. There are certain rules and regulations, certain things you have to do. Social manners and customs, right? right? You can't show up here tonight's talk without a shirt on, right? There's certain rituals, certain formality of how you conduct yourself. Family traditions. We all know this. It's Christmas time. I would grow up, we went to 4 o'clock children's mass, went to CJ and Esther's for gifts with the cousins, came back home, I could finally take off my church clothes, and you could relax, and we weren't allowed to wake up mom and dad before 8 a.m., we had to wait, which is really torturous, I don't think that was a very fair rule. And, but these are customs, right, these are traditions that we have, these are rituals that we go through. Father Kevin C. Soltz, a Benedictine, God rest his soul, said that you are the rituals that you do. 
You are the rituals that you do, the habits that you form, the things that you do. And then it was Father Aidan Kavanaugh, also a Benedictine, who was a monk of St. Myrids, who taught at Notre Dame and taught at Yale. He said, I don't go to Mass because I'm Catholic. I'm Catholic because I go to Mass. Meaning going to Mass is the ritual. It's what you do. You get up and you go, and that then shapes you. It informs who you are. You are what you eat, your habits, right? You have to have a habit of exercise in order to exercise, uh, in order to get healthy, I'm told. I don't know, but I'm told that that's what's okay. So, what's the point? Okay, the point is that as we study Scripture and as we look at the Eucharist, we have to understand that the big context is a marvelous condescension. The God is coming down to our level. First in the Incarnation, which we are celebrating here in the Christmas season. Second in the Sacred Scripture. God is speaking to us through Koine Greek. He's speaking to us through Latin. He's speaking to us through German and Spanish and English. He's uh, speaking to us through different translations of the English Bible. And then also that he condescends down to our level because we are people of habit. We are people of ritual. It is part of who we are. It's in our very fiber. It's in our very being. And one of the things that the Eucharist is, it is a ritual. This is why Jesus says, do this in memory of me. This is a new ritual. It's a new Passover ritual that he is giving to his apostles and he gives to us, which I'll talk about uh, tomorrow night um, and on Friday. So in all three, God meets us at our level. In all three, involve this marvelous cooperation between the divine, that sacred, and the human as well. Okay, you guys with me? If you need to get up, use the restroom, it's a great excuse. If you're falling asleep, no? Okay, here we go. What I want to talk about is I want us to understand the timeline and the history of how we got from the person of Jesus Christ to the Eucharist itself in Christian practice and then 2023. So we can say that there are six stages of transmission. Six stages of transmission. And the first one is the historical event of Jesus Christ himself. Jesus Christ was a first century Jew who lived in Judea and ministered in Galilee. We have in our possession non-Christian sources, including Josephus, who tell us that there was a man, Joshua, who lived in the first century Judea, who got himself in trouble, got himself killed by the Roman Empire. So even atheistic scholars will admit that there was a Jesus in the first century. They don't believe that he was God. They believe that he was sort of a rebel and a street preacher who got himself killed. But in any event, it's no one is debating whether Jesus existed or not. So that's the historical event and we can say that this is roughly zero to the year 33 A.D. on the year of our Lord. Stage two, then, is what we call the early tradition. And the early tradition is going to be, let's see, 33, let's just say 33 to 70. And the early tradition is the immediate years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, but before the Gospels are written. And I can't emphasize this enough, that in this early tradition, probably like 90%, I don't know, I'm making that up, 85, 87, 82.548, I don't know, 90%, basically most of this early tradition was an oral tradition. And only 10% was written. And what was the written? Well, we have Paul, right? Because Paul's writing his letters somewhere from 40 to 64 AD. He's uh, beheaded in Rome in the year 64 or so. But primarily, people are spreading the news, the good news, the gospel, the evangelion of Jesus Christ through the oral tradition. We have to understand this. This is really important, and it's hard for us in 2023, I think, to grasp this. The vast majority of people in the first century were illiterate. They were illiterate. And even if you had a text, texts were rare. Papyrus, expensive, fragile, clay tablets, fragile. And so we were in an oral culture. Most of humanity was an oral culture until recently in the span of human history. 
Um, and this is why Paul's letters were read aloud in the assembly, and it's why when we celebrate Mass, we read the readings aloud. And in his letter, especially I'm thinking of his letter to Philemon, Paul says, make sure this letter is, is read aloud in the assembly. Because people are illiterate. We don't have photocopy machines. We don't have multiple copies of these letters. Um, and so people had in world church, and they would tell stories. Hey, Dad, tell me about Jesus. Oh, that was great. It was about springtime. We'd been with him for about three days. We were starving. And next thing you know, he's like saying some prayers, and he's got like, well, you can eat bread and fish. It was amazing. There were like 5,000 of us there. Because people were telling these girls, hey, Grandma, tell me about Jesus. Oh, it's great that he was coming into Jerusalem. There were all these people around him. There's this woman. She'd been bleeding, hemorrhaging for 12 years. And all she did, I think, was touch his cloak. And bam, she was healed. It was amazing. He said something like, your faith has saved you, something like that. It was great. So this is the oral tradition. And this is so very important because, in a sense, the church... The living assembly predates written scripture. That the tradition of the Eucharist and how Christians prayed precedes uh, written scripture. Okay, we have then the third stage, composition of the Gospels. We can say that Mark was written around the year 70, and then we can say that uh, Matthew and Luke uh, written around the year 85. So here we have, finally, someone's going to take and write down a comprehensive life of Jesus Christ. And Mark is going to begin, he's going to be very short, he's got 16 chapters. Uh, Matthew gets lengthier, he's got 28 chapters. But this is the writing, the Gospels, and again, there were many Gospels, but it was finally these four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that were decided upon to be included in the New Testament. We then have the preservation of manuscripts. This would be about, oh, sorry. And then around the year 100, we have John. He's last but not least. He was feast days today, St. John the Evangelist. Uh, we then have the preservation of manuscripts, and this is going to be like from 100 to 400. This is a long time, right? We don't have photocopy machines, but people have got their hands on a copy of Mark, and they're going to write down Mark. They're going to get a copy of Matthew, and write down Matthew. This is why we have different manuscripts of Mark, how chapter 16 ends differently, etc., because people make mistakes. They get tired, and they don't write it out correctly, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then we have translation. Now, translation, we can think of translation as the year 400. We can think of translation as being associated with Saint Jerome. Jerome was a cardinal of Rome. He was brilliant, a polyglot. Uh, he was also uh, really mean. <laughs> Uh, he was a curmudgeon. He didn't have a very good personality. He, did, he was a great scripture scholar, sitting in his room alone by his desk. And, right, and he lived in Bethlehem, and he translated the Greek Old Testament, the Septuagint, and the Greek New Testament into Latin. He translated it into the Vulgate. And the Vulgate comes to us from the word vulgar. When we think of vulgar language, we think of cuss words. It's not that exciting. Vulgar here is Latin, because Latin was the language of the streets. It was the language of the market. Uh, it was the language of, of bankers. You know, very, very vulgar street language. Okay, I'm sorry, that's my attempt at humor. Okay, and then, then we have reception. That's any time you open the Bible and study in personal a prayer, in mass, with everyone else, you're receiving the words, okay? So we can think of this as the historical Jesus was an event. Last year's Super Bowl, February of 23. It actually happened. Thousands of people were there. Millions of people watched on TV. It was an event. No one debates it. And then you had the next morning, primarily people talking at the water coolers. Did you see the Super Bowl last night? Yeah, wasn't that amazing? I can't believe they passed on third and one. I can't believe that ref called that call. And then a few people write it down, watch the Super Bowl last night, Father Michael was there at the party, he's such an awesome guy, so, but it was mostly oral tradition. And then you have the AP wire, and you have ESPN, and they're writing an official account of the Super Bowl itself, and then people pick up the AP wire, Dallas Morning News, Arkansas Democratic Gazette, that still exists. And then the French newspapers pick up the translation because they have some French who watch American football, and then people read about it. So this took 2,000 years. And what I wanted you to really focus on, though, is this oral tradition. Because when we read tomorrow 1 Corinthians, 
That's the earliest account of the Last Supper. And it's Paul writing around, what, 55, writing to the Corinthians? Mark's Last Supper is into the year 70. So this oral tradition is very important, meaning this is tradition. This is the church. And we'll see how this plays out tomorrow night. Um, let's look at 1 Corinthians. We'll look at 1 Corinthians and John 6, and then we'll wrap it up uh, for the evening. So 1 Corinthians, this is chapter 11. And again, this is the earliest written account of the Last Supper. Because Paul's writing in the 50s, Mark isn't written until the 70s. For I, Paul, received from the Lord what I also handed on to you. But the Lord Jesus on the 19th was handed over to bread. And after he had given thanks, broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also the cup, after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes. Paul had to receive this. Paul wasn't there. Paul was a Jewish Pharisee, breathing murderous threats, killing Christians, having them arrested, having their doors beaten down at two in the morning. He wasn't at the Last Supper. So he had to receive this. That means the tradition, the church, preceded the written scriptures. So someone had to show him this. When he's in Damascus, when he's in Antioch, when he's in Jerusalem, he was praying with Christians who were celebrating the Eucharist. I received from the Lord what I also handed on to you, because he lived in Corinth for a few years, and he taught the Corinthians how to pray the Eucharist. Handed on to you is the Latin tradere, tradition. Hey, my great-grandmother has a pie recipe that she gave it to my grandmother, and she handed it down to her mother, and then she handed it down to her daughter. And something that's handed down to us, this is what we do. This is how we celebrate Christmas. We go to so-and-so's house and always cook a turkey. So something was handed down to Paul. But the night that Jesus was handed over, and this is a play on words, because handed over is also tradere. Think about the word betray. He was betrayed. You see the tray in there, tradere. He was handed over. He took right after he had given things broken and said, this is my body. So what we have to keep in mind tomorrow night and Friday night is that when he says body here, he's referring to the crucifix. Do this in remembrance of me. What is that? That is ritual. It's the mass. In the same way also the cup is the cup of uh, my blood. Blood was very taboo. Blood, Jews were not allowed to drink any blood whatsoever. But we're going to see in Exodus... God ratifies a covenant with Moses and Aaron by sprinkling blood on the altar. Do this as often. Again, it's ritual. For as often as you eat this bread, that's also ritual. You proclaim his death until it comes again. So here we have Christian practices in the oral tradition they precede the written New Testament. Meaning, when we talk about the scriptural roots of the Eucharist, we have to keep in mind that it's something sacred, it's also something human. That it uh, has to do with scripture, but also do, it has to do with the church. Let's look at John 6. In John's Gospel, the Last Supper is not a Passover meal, so we have to go to John 6 to find this Eucharistic theology. Then Jesus took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed them to those who were reclining, and also as much of the fish as they wanted. This is the feeding of the 5,000. When they had had their fill, he said to his disciples, Gather the fragments left over so that nothing will be wasted. So they collected them and filled twelve wicker baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves that had been uh, that had been more than they could eat. So this is the beginning of John 6. Well, it's in the middle of John 6. And he said all these people, they have all they can eat, right? All you can eat buffet, and there are all these leftovers. And Jesus is so focused, all anything waste. Let anything waste, we're going to gather the fragments. And think about how John chapter 17 
It's all about how Jesus doesn't want any of the people given to him to be lost, to be wasted. He wants to gather everyone in unity, the people in John 17. Now look at this, the Didache. The Didache is an ancient document, also around the same time as John, maybe a little bit later, and it means the teachings. It's a great document. It's a great document to read. It tells you that baptism should occur with living water, meaning water that's flowing and not stagnant. Have you ever been to a church where the holy water font has like, like stuff growing on the, on the top of it? <laughs> it's like, well, that was happening in the early church. And so it needs to be flowing water, cold and crisp and cool water. Um, it also tells you not that Christians do not commit infanticide and Christians do not commit abortion. Have you heard the argument that say, well, Christians being against abortion, that's a very recent uh, change. The Christian, you know, no, 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 no. This is from the year 100. We've been very clear. No infanticide, leaving your child on the roadside, and no abortion either. So it's a beautiful document. But notice this prayer of post-communion. So they just celebrate the Eucharist, and this is what the presider prays. As this broken bread was scattered upon the mountains, that's a direct reference to Matt, to John 6, but was brought together and became one, because Jesus says, gather. So let the church, say, let the church be gathered together from the ends of the earth into the kingdom for the Lord and Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. Meaning, what's happening here is in John 6 being written around the year 100, it reflects the practice of the church. That after receiving Holy Communion, the priest says, just as this Eucharist, this bread, was scattered upon the mountains, but was brought together to become one, so let your church, the people of God, also be gathered together as one. It's beautiful theology. And what it's showing us here is that Scripture and the early church teachings are growing hand in hand together. And that part of what we do when we celebrate the Eucharist is we're stepping into what Scripture tells us to do. But we're also stepping into the uh, beautiful tradition of 2,000 years of the church that very much precedes Scripture itself, beginning with St. Paul's letters. Um, these are a few passages that we'll study over the next two nights. I hope you do come back and join us. Uh, we'll start a little early tomorrow night because of the rosary. Uh, so we'll start around, let's say, uh, 540, 545. Thanks. Have a blessed night. Okay, well, welcome back. Um, again, I want to say a word of thanks to uh, the Eucharistic Revival Committee who uh, helped to organize this for Todd and Joseph and others working with technology. I'm very, very grateful. We had a good night last night, and uh, what I want to do is I want to review a little bit of what we covered last night and then get in tonight into some really beautiful, profound uh, theology of the origins of, of the Eucharist. Um, I did have to prepare a little bit uh, today. I knew that Aunt Millie would be here, so I had to Google how to handle hecklers and what to do with them. So I'm, I'm well prepared for criticisms here. Okay. So I just want to review, and, and what is that? We have the four canonical Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No one Gospel fully uh, in, uh, it captures the mystery, the totality of who Jesus Christ is. Um, in one way, though, that they, they do, they each have their own particular focus on who Jesus is, something about his mystery. And so what we do as Christians is we take all four Gospels and combine them together as a composite to understand the beauty and the goodness and the truth of Jesus Christ. And the main takeaway that I was trying to convey last night is that Dei Verbum says that sacred scripture is both the word of God and it's also the work of humanity. That God uses us, and he uses language, he uses customs and society to convey and communicate his divine reality uh, to us. And one of my favorite lines of Dei Verbum, and again there are copies here, sections 11 through 13, if you haven't read it yet, is that he says that God approaches us with a divine condescension. Divine condescension. Dissension here, condescension is not a negative 
Oh, he was so condescending to me. Rather, this is something very beautiful. It's marvelous. It means that God comes down to our level. So the incarnation in this Christmas season right, we're in right now, we're celebrating the incarnation, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a great example of a divine, marvelous condescension. That God has come down to our world. He has come down to our level to be one with us. He is Emmanuel. God is with us. But sacred scripture is also this great example of divine condescension. That we are coming to know who God is through Hebrew language and through the Greek language and eventually through the Latin language and translation and English, German, and Spanish. And we're using words and vocabulary uh, and syntax in order to come to understand something of who God is. And then thirdly, last night I mentioned that God uses uh, ritual to communicate his divine life to us because we are creatures of ritual. We're creatures of habit. We have morning routines. We have our secular civil government rituals when a new president is inaugurated in the parade and the Supreme Court justices. It's a, it's a, a beautiful ritual. We also have religious rituals because that speaks to us as human beings. We have our habits. We have our rituals. So all of these are examples of divine condescension, of God coming down to our level to reveal something of his life to you and to me. I then mention these beautiful quotes, especially from the late Father Aiden Kavanaugh. I don't go to Mass on Sundays or each day because I'm Catholic. Rather, I'm Catholic because I go to Mass, meaning that ritual that we enter into, it shapes us, it forms us, like exercise. If you get up each morning and do your exercises, again, I'm told, I don't really have much experience, but then that's going to shape you physically, it's going to shape you mentally, and you get into that habit, that ritual, because you're doing it. Uh, so you're, you're Catholic because you go to Mass. And in a way, it's fulfilling 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Jesus saying, do this in remembrance of me. It's a new mandate. Uh, it's a new command. Uh, it's part of a ritual that our Lord has given to us. One of the things that uh, I also covered last night is just the general timeline. And the big takeaway is that we have this first stage of the event of Jesus Christ, but then we have this really big period, the stage two of the early tradition. Excuse me. So here we have the historical Jesus. This is about those first 33 years of the first century. And then we have the second stage, and this is from 34 to about 70 when Mark's gospel is first written. And so we have these 40 years or so where it's primarily an oral tradition. And the importance of this is that it shows that the Christian assembly was getting together for these 36, 40 years. And it was in that practice that they were coming to understand what the Eucharist is, coming to understand who Jesus is, what the gospel is. And then eventually it was written down, uh, principally during this period by St. Paul. So here we looked at last night at 1 Corinthians. This is the oldest account that we have in our possession of the Last Supper, because Paul is writing this in the 50s. Mark is not written until the year 70. Matthew and Luke until 85. John until the year 100. This is the earliest. And notice what Paul says, I received from the Lord what I also handed down to you. And so this is tradere I mentioned last night. And we get the noun traditio because it's a tradition that is handed down to us. And so that had to be given to Paul, even before it's written down, you see? The church assembly, the church practice of celebrating the Eucharist predates, it precedes the Eucharist itself. Okay, let's see, do do do, skip along here for the sake of time. Okay, so there's your review. The point is that the Eucharist is not an, anom an anomaly, that the Eucharist and the sacraments go hand in hand with sacred scripture, they go hand in hand with the incarnation itself. This is the marvelous condescension by which God communicates his very life to us. So let's review, before I get into some really beautiful theology of the Eucharist tonight, let's review our timeline. We want to go back to Abraham about 2,000 years roughly before the birth of Jesus Christ. And God goes to Abraham and to Sarah and says, you will have as many descendants as the stars in the sky. So Abraham is the great patriarch uh, for the Jewish and the Christian people. So it's very important. And what's really important is all he had in his possession was the gift of faith. And so in Galatians and in Romans, Paul emphasizes faith. But that's another talk. 
But then we're going to fast forward about five, six, seven hundred years to Moses. And this is especially important for us tonight. Because here, Moses, at this point in time, is a shepherd, and he experiences the burning bush. And God says to him, I want you to go into Egypt, and I want you to rescue my Hebrew people, my chosen people, out of bondage of physical slavery into the promised land to Jerusalem and the Canaan uh, region. So this is very important for us tonight. Moses, Mount Sinai, the burning bush, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Then we're going to fast forward to King David. And the reason King David is important is because here now, the Jewish kingship is, is established, and what we have after David is his son Solomon. And Solomon is going to build the temple, the temple of Solomon, the beautiful temple to give glory to God or sacrifice to be offered to God. But around 5, what, 567, 570, the Babylonians destroyed the first temple. And so the Jewish people began to rebuild it and they build the second temple. And so during the life of Jesus, when he's walking around, when he's driving out the money changers in the temple, when he's going there to pray because he's a good Jewish man, that is the second temple. The second temple. But that second temple was destroyed. The Babylonians destroyed the first temple, and it was the Romans around the year 70. Well, was the year 70. You know that for sure. The Romans destroyed the Jewish temple because the Jews revolted against the Roman Empire for being oppressive and heavy taxation. And the Romans said, no, no. <laughs> and they came in and they destroyed the temple. The only thing we're left standing is the western wall and maybe a defensive turret built by King Herod. So what's important is... This temple is destroyed. There's no longer a chance to offer sacrifice in the physical temple in Jerusalem. There is no third temple that's never been rebuilt. So that's going to be important for us. Because in John's Gospel, Jesus says, you're no longer going to worship in a particular temple. You're going to worship in spirit and in truth. And this is all very, very important. So Moses is important. The fact that the, the temple is, is destroyed is very important for our discussions tonight. Paul does his ministry throughout those years. Mark writes his Gospel, year 70. Matthew and Luke around 85. Book of Revelation, Gospel of St. John, both written between 90 and 100, roughly. And then the Didache. We looked at the Didache a little bit last night. This is just a church document. It's a fascinating document. It talks about morality. It talks about how to baptize. It gives the priest a uh, celebrate certain prayers to pray. It's a beautiful document written around the same time, maybe a little later. And then from the 100s until the 400s, you have the church growing throughout the known world. And you have the Didascale Apostle Lord. That means the teaching of the apostles. It's another church document talking about the good qualities of a bishop, the good qualities of a priest. Um, and then we have finally the translation from the Greek into Latin. And then we have all of us here today. But for our purposes tonight, we want to be mindful of Moses and the Passover out of Egypt and we're going to be mindful of the temple. Okay, so that's what we're going to be mindful of. Uh, we'll skip that. Okay, now, I try to teach my college students that plagiarism is a mortal sin. You can't plagiarize, right? You have to cite your sources. What I'm giving you tonight, I'm saying it openly for you present and you online, this is a summation of a book that I cannot recommend enough to you. It is such a great book. Uh, Jew Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist by Dr. Brandt, a patron. It is a, a wonderful, wonderful book. It's very accessible. It is so rich. Every page is dripping with very beautiful, important theology of Scripture and of the Eucharist. Uh, I got to be with him this September. There's yours truly there on the right. Uh, and there he uh, ran his uh, with the beard and the blue suit. He was a keynote speaker for one of our liturgy conferences up in the Twin Cities. Just a delightful man, a great scholar, lives with his family down in Louisiana. Highly, highly, highly recommend uh, this book. Okay. So who is Jesus according to Mark, Matthew, and Luke? Remember, they all have their different perspectives. Well, Mark, not exclusively, but Mark is going to emphasize that Jesus is a suffering servant based on Isaiah 53. There were many Jews in the first century who had all sorts of different ideas about who the Messiah would be. Who's going to be the Savior of the world? Who's going to return and redeem Israel? It's going to cast away these pagan, dirty Romans who are oppressing us. 
who are heavily tax, uh, uh, taxing us. And so there were some Jewish men and women in the first century, the time of Jesus, and they were expecting a warrior king, someone of the house of David, right? Because the prophets say that he would be of the house of David, the lineage of David, but a real warrior, a real warrior who can establish a political dynasty here on earth. And the apostles, the 12 apostles, they think this is awesome. Jesus is here. He's the Messiah. He's a warrior king. And Peter's probably thinking, I want to be his first lieutenant. I want to be in charge of Europe. James is like, I'm going to take over Australia. I'll be in charge of all of Australia. It's going to be amazing. And James and John, the sons of Zebedee, say, can we send your left and your right when you enter into your kingdom here on earth? And Jesus is like, you don't know what you're talking about. Because Jesus is not a warrior king. He's very opposite. Do we have a crucifix up yet? Yeah, I get a crucifix. He's the very opposite of the warrior king. He's a suffering servant. And so all throughout Mark's gospel, Jesus is the opposite. He tries to teach the disciples, I have to die. I have to lay down my life. I have to be a servant. I have to suffer for you. And Peter says, that's crazy. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. Right? Because you're thinking as humans do. Power and ruling. So that's Mark primarily. Luke is going to focus on Jesus as an innocent prophet, meaning his words are true and good in that long line of great prophets, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, etc., etc. And you're either going to accept him or you're going to reject him. And the great example of this is on the cross. Now, in all the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus is crucified between two thieves. It's only in Luke where there's a dialogue. And in the dialogue, one rejects Jesus, says, give me a break. You're the Messiah, snap your fingers, take us to the Cayman Islands, get us out of here, let's go to the Bahamas, come on. And the other says, we're guilty. This man, Jesus, is innocent. Please remember me when you go into your kingdom. So part of Luke is you either accept the word of Jesus or you reject it. Now, the main focus for us tonight is Matthew, because in Matthew's gospel, Jesus is the new Moses. Because Moses predicts that there will be a new prophet that follows after him. And so Jesus is the new Moses who's instituting a new Passover during a new Exodus. And that's what we want to focus on tonight. So, overwhelming evidence that in the Matthew, in Gospel of Matthew, Jesus is portrayed as a new Moses. One example is Egypt. It's only in Matthew's Gospel that Mary and Joseph and Jesus, the Holy Family, flee from Herod and go into Egypt. That was the gospel today on the Feast of the Holy Innocents. And for Matthew, this fulfills the prophet Hosea, chapter 11, who says, Out of Egypt I called my son. But remember, it was Moses, a shepherd, who was sent to Egypt to convince Pharaoh to release the Hebrew people out of physical slavery, out of Egypt. Jesus is the new Moses who's here to free us, not from physical slavery, but from spiritual slavery to sin and to death. Moses, part B here, Moses is the traditional author of the, uh, the Torah, the Jewish law. And the Jewish law can be found in the first five books of the Old Testament, Genesis, Deuteronomy, Exodus, Numbers, and Leviticus. So there are five books that begin the Old Testament. Tradition says that Moses writes these books. So people in the first century are going to associate Moses with the number five. And so what does Matthew do? In his gospel, he writes five big sections or five big speeches in his gospel. Chapters 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And where does Moses get the, the Ten Commandments? Up on a mountain, Mount Sinai. And where does Jesus teach? Up on a mountain. And what's the first thing he does? He's teaching, just like Moses is the great lawgiver, the great teacher. Chapter 10, Jesus sends the disciples out on a mission. Chapter 13, it's a parable after parable after parable. Chapter 18, it's about the church. How often must I forgive? Seven times? No, 70 times seven. What do we do with the troublemaker? The weeds and the wheat growing together, giving the assembly the authority to loose and to bind. And then chapters 23, 24, 25 is the last big section. And it begins with a series of woes to the Jewish leadership. Notice that the first big section begins with three chapters, five, six, and seven, and begins with blessings. And notice that the last section is also three chapters, 23, 24, 25, and begins with curses. That's not by accident. Matthew does that on purpose, to create a mirror image of these five big sections. And what's even more fun is that at the end of each of these sections, so at the end of 7, the end of 10, the end of 13, the end of 18, the end of 25, Matthew says, 
Having finished these words, dot, dot, dot. It's code language to us that this section is done. So this is Matthew's way of getting you to associate Jesus with the five uh, original books of the Old Testament to associate Jesus with Moses. Now Matthew chapter 5, 17 through 18, this is letter C, only found in Matthew's Gospel. It's found nowhere else. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets, and by law here he means the Jewish law written by Moses, the Mosaic law. Rather, I have come not to abolish, I have come to fulfill. See, he's the new Moses, Moses 2.0. And then I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter, the smallest part of the letter will pass from the law until all things have taken place. So this is again Matthew explaining that Jesus is the new Moses who's here to fulfill the Mosaic law. And then we have these 12 fulfillment citations that shows that the Old Testament is being fulfilled by the works of Jesus. And this is only found in Matthew. Hosea 11 is one of those fulfillment citations that Jesus is here to fulfill what Moses began 1,300 years earlier. There are more parallels between Jesus and Moses. Both fasted for 40 days and for 40 nights. The Jesus' first miracle in John's Gospel is changing water into wine, one of my favorites, and what was one of the first acts that Moses does in front of Pharaoh? He changes water into blood. So it's not by accident. And then, in 1 Corinthians, Jesus says, this cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. What does he mean, a new covenant? Because there was an old covenant that was established with Moses. We'll see that here in a little bit. So Jesus is taking the good of Moses, and he's bringing it to fulfillment. And just as Moses brought people out of physical slavery, Jesus brings us out of spiritual slavery, and just as Moses followed the command of God for a Passover meal, so too Jesus gives us a Passover meal at the Last Supper, which becomes the Eucharist. So let's talk about that new covenant here, this new covenant that Jesus talks about. In Exodus 24, 5 through 11, we read, And Moses took the blood of the covenant and threw it upon the people, and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and seventy of the elders of Israel went up onto the mountain, and they saw the God of Israel. They saw the God of Israel. They beheld God, and they ate and they drank. So what's important here is that they're free from slavery. They had the Passover meal in Egypt, they're free from slavery, and now, having been brought into safety, God establishes a covenant with Moses and his Hebrew people, and that covenant is made by throwing blood upon the people. So we have blood, and then Moses and the other leaders, the 70, they eat. And when they eat with God, they get to see God. Now just think about how amazing that is. You get to see God. You get to eat with God. Very intimate. Very rare. So this is very important. The image of a blood, an image of a banquet. We're going to see that as we go along. Okay, let's talk about the temple. Let's talk about the temple as well. So what happens is, Moses and the Hebrew people have been freed from Egypt. And they're now in the desert for 40 years, wandering around to go to the promised land. And they have with them sacred objects. And so they don't have a temple that's been built, like this beautiful building we're in tonight. They just have a tent. And they pack up the tent, and they keep going each day, and then they unpack the tent and set it back up, and they do this every day and every night. But this tent is the prototype for what will eventually be the Temple of Solomon, which will be eventually become the second temple, the first destroyed by the Babylonians, the second destroyed by the Romans. Okay. So here is the architecture of this tent, this tabernacle, what would become the temple. You have an outer court for the animal sacrifice, right? Oblations that you make to God because of your sins. You then have a second area, and this is the holy place, and you have a lamp, a Jewish menorah, and you have an altar where incense is burned, and then you have this table with 12 cakes of bread which becomes known as the bread of the presence, the presence of God. 
And then you have this third area, the Holy of Holies. And only the high priest can go in here. And here you have the Ark of the Covenant that holds the Ten Commandments, or the leftovers of the Ten Commandments, the ta broken tablets. You have an urn that holds the, the I was going to say magical, the, the blessed and miraculous manna, the bread that came down from heaven. And you have the staff of Aaron that blossomed. So here we have... Here we have this area where you have an altar of sacrifice for the animals, for the bloodletting. Here you have the altar for incense. Here you have the lamp. Here you have the table for the bread of the presence, and that's very important. Then here you have the Holy of Holies, right? You have this first area, the second area, and this third area. And here you have the Ark of the Covenant with the Ten Commandments. You're going to have the manna. I think the oil was for the anointing. Pretty sure. And then you have Aaron's staff. So this is this is very important because we have sacrifice, and Jesus is going to sacrifice himself, his blood will be spilled. You're going to have this bread of the presence of God. And this bread of the presence, every spring, was brought out from the temple so that the people in the streets could view it and could gaze upon God. And think about how we say Eche on your stage. Behold the Lamb of God, we gaze upon her. Think about Eucharistic adoration. We gaze upon the host, and God is there in our midst. We get to dwell with him. We get to gaze upon his face. Then we have the manna, this daily bread that was given to them for the journey. Um, so this is all going to play a part in Jesus. Now keep this in mind. While this is all happening, think about the second temple. This is the temple that was built that was there when Jesus is living and ministering and preaching. He saw this with his own eyes. He knew about these three rooms. He knew what was in there. He knew that this is a beautiful ritual of the old covenant. And it worked, and he wanted to give to us. Now that he has fulfilled Moses, he wants to give us a new covenant. So there's all these beautiful parallels, aren't there, between the Old Testament presence of God and the New Testament. Okay, so let's go back to Egypt, 1300 or so. The Hebrew people are stuck in slavery. And God gives to Moses and to the Hebrew people a ritual, a Passover meal. So what we have is the original event. This is about 1300 BC. And we're in Egypt. And God is going to pass over the homes of the Hebrew people. And if they do not do the ritual, if they don't follow the ritual of God, if they don't have the Passover meal, then their firstborn male child will be killed. And of course, the pagan pharaoh and the Egyptians don't do the silly little ritual, and so their firstborn uh, sons are killed. And therefore, Pharaoh finally, struck with grief, says, get out of here, let them go. So then we have a new event, a new Passover. This is gonna be in Jerusalem. And Jesus is going to pass over from this life to the next. So when we talk about the Passover of Jesus, God passed over the Hebrew homes and spared them death. Jesus is going to pass from this life to the next. And in Greek, that is called the Pascha. And that's why at Easter time, we celebrate in a special way the Paschal mystery. The Paschal mystery, I'm talking about this tomorrow night. This is commemorating how Jesus, by laying down his life on the cross, passed over from this to the next. And because he has done that, you and I get to participate, as Paul says, by our baptism in the passing over from this life to the next. So we have then in Egypt in 1300, we have the original meal, the original instructions that God gives us in Exodus. We then have this Passover ritual meal that Jesus celebrates in the first century, around year 33, and then we have the Last Supper that Jesus celebrates with his disciples and he gives us a new Passover. Because it's similar to the Jewish Passover meal, but it has some really big differences. And it's from this new Passover meal, ritual, we get the Eucharist. Okay, uh, big graph, what do we need to know? So there were, in the time of Jesus, lots of Jewish holidays, just as there are today. But there were three really important ones 
that were called pilgrimage feasts. Pilgrimage feasts. And every good Jewish man on these three feasts would have to travel to Jerusalem to celebrate these feasts. So Passover in the spring, it's found in Exodus, it's commemorating being freed out of slavery from, uh, the, from the Egyptians. Uh, Shabbat or Pentecost, so Jewish Pentecost is original. The, the reason why our apostles are in the upper room and are afraid is because at Passover, their leader, Jesus, got killed. And they're thinking, well, we're next, let's hide out. And then it's 50 days later at the Feast of Pentecost, there are still millions of people, right? Every good Jewish man had to be in the city of Jerusalem. This is why on Pentecost Sunday, after they've received the Holy Spirit, there are all these men, Jewish men from the known world speaking all these different languages. And they're able to say, they're able to baptize over 3,000. And they're able to speak all these different languages, right? That's why, that's why they're there. It's because it's a Jewish feast of Pentecost. And then the, the festival of tabernacles or booths. So what's important about this is that Jesus, being a good Jewish man, would have been in Jerusalem for these big pilgrimage festivals, Passover, Pentecost, and Booths, or uh, Shuvot, or Tabernacles, different names for it. But this is the important one for us when it comes to uh, the Eucharist. Okay, so let's look at the original Passover meal as directed by God in the book of Exodus, chapter 12. You have to take an unblemished male lamb, no broken bones, no diseases, an unblemished male lamb. You have to sacrifice the lamb. And so all of these Hebrew families in Egypt, it's going to be the father and the sons who help to slaughter the lamb. It's going to be domestic, it's going to be personal. Each family takes care of their own. They're then to take the blood of the lamb and they're to spread it over the doorpost, the wooden doorpost. And that's the sign for God's angel of death to pass over and to spare them. But then, really importantly, you got to eat the lamb. You got to eat the lamb. Five times where you're supposed to eat it. That the sacrifice, the ritual, isn't complete until it's been consummated by eating the flesh. And then God says, you're going to keep this as a day of remembrance. Every year in the spring, you're going to pause, you're going to travel up to Jerusalem, you're going to offer a lamb, you're going to offer sacrifice and thanksgiving to God for what he has done for you, the Hebrew people. Now here's what's different between this original Passover in Egypt in 1300 BC and the Passover in the temple during the time of Jesus. First of all, it's no longer done in the home. The sacrifice of the lamb is done not by the dad and the son, rather it's being done now in the temple. Because now, in the time of Egypt, you had every Hebrew male, in a sense, was a priest, but now in the temple in the first century, there are the Levites, there are particular priest groups in the Jewish people. They're the ones who sacrifice the lamb. So it's no longer a domestic uh, event. You go to the temple, they line up the lambs, they skim, they let the blood out, and then you take the lamb home uh, to roast it. The, it goes from a domestic slaughtering to, we can think of it as a crucifixion of the lambs by the priests. So Josephus was a pagan historian who wrote a book uh, on the Jewish war uh, he, in around the year 75. Because remember, the Jewish war ends around 73 after the temple is destroyed in the year 70. The, the, again, the Romans put the kibosh on that and said, you know, we're just going to destroy your holy place because of this Jewish uprising. And what does he say? What does Josephus say? He says that in Jerusalem, in the first century, there were about 256,000 lambs slaughtered. This is very much a sacrifice. Just think of all the blood that's being poured onto the altar for this great feast commemorating the Passover. And that means, because you couldn't have more than 10 people per lamb, that means that you probably have something about 2.7 million people in Jerusalem when Jesus is being crucified. That's why there's a big crowd. Because crucifixions uh, were public events, they were spectacles, they were entertainment. Uh, you ever watch the movie True Grit, right? When John Wayne goes into uh, Fort Smith and there's a hanging, and people are in their Sunday best, they bring their wagons and picnics, right? And they, they, they have cakes and pot, because it was, it was entertainment. Same thing in the first century, there were all these people there, and some of them were able to watch the crucifixion. So let's talk about this crucifixion of the lambs. 
there's a lamb. And we know through historical documents that the way that the high priest would slaughter this 275,000 plus lambs is they would take small skewers and they would place them through the shoulders of the lambs so they could then hang them up and skin them. And then they would take a rod and they would go through the buttocks and through the neck so that you can then put them on a spit and have them roasted. And so it forms a type of crucifixion of the lambs. These are things that Jesus would have known. He would have been mindful of this as he's living his life as a good Jewish man for a century. And then what's different is that the Jewish people in the first century are participating. They're participating in the original Passover. There's a theology of participation. So this comes from the Mishnah. The Mishnah is a, a Jewish uh, a series of books, volumes of books, and they're commentaries upon uh, the events of the Judaism, the theology of Judaism. Uh, they're, they're commentaries, they're homilies, etc. This one is on the Pesachim, which is the Passover lambs. In every generation, a man must so regard himself as if he came forth himself out of Egypt, as if he came forth himself. Right? This is an event that was 1,300 years ago. But you're to celebrate Passover as if you yourself were in slavery, as if you yourself were there, gathering your wife and kids and getting ready to leave your home and to go out into the desert and to run away from Pharaoh. For it is written in Exodus 13, 8, it is because of what the Lord did for me when I came forth out of Egypt. Right? These people at the time of Jesus, they didn't live it. That was 1,300 years ago. But they're, they're thankful as if it was I myself who came out of Egypt. Therefore, we are bound to give thanks. And Eucharist means thanksgiving. And to bless him who wrought all these wonders for our fathers and for us. So it wasn't just an event that, that was beneficial to Jewish people 1,300 years before Jesus. It's for people celebrating it in the time of Jesus. He brought us out of bondage to freedom, from sorrow to gladness, and from mourning to a festival day, and from darkness to great light, and from servitude to redemption. So let us say before him the Alleluia. So in, in the Jewish faith, there's this deep sense of remembrance. And it's not just a memory that's shallow. It's a deep, deep memory. It's a deep, deep memory. So in our Christian faith, we have something very similar. And we use the Greek word anamnesis. It's a remembrance. It's a recalling of the Lord's death. And they echo the Jewish Passover representation, making present again the great salvific act, now shifted from the Exodus to the crucifixion and resurrection. So, Anime says every time we celebrate Mass, it's not a superficial memorial. It says, hey, remember that event that happened 2,000 years ago? You know, it was the night before he died and he got together and said some nice words over bread and wine. It's a, it's a deep memory. It's a deep memory that Christ is truly present, that the event is made present once again. This is why Paul, even though he never met the earthly Jesus, can still rejoice because he's there in Corinth and in Philippi and in Rome celebrating the Eucharist. He's having fellowship with Christ. So when you and I celebrate the Mass, it is a deep memory. It's a deep memory. So my dad can say, Michael, remember you bought that movie on Prime Videos, $10? And I'd be like, oh, yeah, I remember that. That was last week. That's a superficial memory. Or he could say, Michael, remember you bought a $10 movie on my account? I'm like, oh, yeah. And I have to reach into my wallet and pull out $10 and give it to him. That's an anamnesis. It's, it's a memory that enacts action. It makes something present. It's not just a superficial memory. So for the Jewish people and for Jesus himself, as he's living in ministry, he would have had this deep sense of participation that when you celebrate the Passover meal, it is as if you yourself have been freed from slavery. So when you and I celebrate the Eucharist, we are entering into an event that's not just a mere memorial, rather it is making present Calgary, it is making present the sacrifice of Christ who died for you, for me. It's a deep, deep, abiding uh, memory. Okay. You guys with me? Okay. Feel free to get up, get some lemonade, some sugar, and some caffeine. Don't be shy. Let's keep moving to the Last Supper, right? So we looked at the original Passover when they're in Egypt. 
We looked at the ritual Passover meal during the time of Jesus. Let's look at the Last Supper of what Jesus was doing. Clearly, according to Mark, and according to Matthew, and according to Luke, the Last Supper that Jesus celebrated with his apostles was a Passover meal. It's very clear all throughout Mark, Matthew, and Luke. But there are differences. The first is that Jesus is celebrating this Passover meal not with his family, but with his disciples. That was very, be very strange, right? You were to go back to your family, uh, either you were the father, you would go to your father's house, you would celebrate the Passover with your family. But remember, Jesus in his ministry, he redefines what family is. Right there, knocking on the door, hey, your mom and sisters and cousins are out wanting to talk to you. And Jesus says, these people listening to me preach, these are my brothers and sisters and mothers, those who do the will of my Heavenly Father. So Jesus, all throughout his ministry, is redefining what it means to be family. And so here, he's including those who are not related to him by blood, but who are related to him by following him. So that's why you and I can enter into the Eucharist, not as because we're somehow related to him, or because we have Jewish blood in our veins, as did Jesus, or because we're the house of David, as was Jesus. Of course not. We're able to enter into the Eucharist, into the Last Supper, because we are disciples, because we're followers of him. He talks about a new covenant, not just an old covenant, right? So in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, that oldest description of the Last Supper, he says, take this, all of you, and drink. This is the blood of the new covenant. What was the old covenant? The old covenant is what I showed you in a previous slide from Exodus. When Moses takes the blood and he slings it upon the people, and he says, this is a sign of the new covenant. And then he and the elders have a feast, right, up on the mountain with God. So he's clearly establishing a new covenant. He's not just commemorating something of the past. He's doing something now brand new. There is no mention of eating a lamb, right? Right? They just, they, just, they just sacrificed earlier that day, or yet the day before, close to 300,000 lambs. There's no, there's no mention of a lamb in the Last Supper. None whatsoever. Why? Because Jesus is the new lamb. He's the body. He's the one who's going to be sacrificed. He's the one who's going to be crucified. Uh, he's the one who's going to be stripped, right, of his garments, just as the lambs were skinned. He's going to be stripped. So Jesus himself is the unblemished male Paschal lamb. He's the one whose bones were not broken, just like in the original Passover. And remember that Passover was completed by eating the flesh of the lamb. Five times we're told you must eat the flesh. You can't just take the blood and put it on the door clothes. You can't just roast it. You have to eat it to consummate, to fulfill the sacrifice. And what does Paul say in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians? Christ is our Passover lamb. And he has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the feast. So it was very clear. And again, 1 Corinthians is, is what, roughly 55 or so, 56. And so it's very clear that the early church in these 20, 25 years had a very clear sense that Jesus Christ is the sacrificial lamb. That's why there's no mention of a lamb in the Last Supper. There's mention of bread, and there's mention of wine, there's mention of body, there's mention of blood. But Jesus is the lamb. He's the Paschal lamb itself. Okay, so there are, I hope, I hope you enjoy this. I hope you're seeing the beautiful parallels and the connections between what's happening, the, the salvific work of God in Egypt, and then how Jesus comes out of that tradition and takes the rituals, right, that divine condescension of the first century, the rituals of the, of the bread and of the wine and of the lambs, and how he takes it, he gives us this new form, this new mode, this new Passover uh, meal and ritual. But there are other elements, and then uh, I'll wrap this up. There are beautiful, beautiful elements. First of all, as they're exiting out of Egypt and they're wandering the desert for 40 years, they're given manna to eat. Every morning, like dew on the ground, there would be this light, flaky bread. And they were allowed to gather a day's portion, unless it was Friday, and you can't work on Saturday and Sabbath, you can gather two days' portion. And so they would eat this manna, and manna comes from the Hebrew, meaning, what is it? Because <laughs> it's strange, right? It's this miraculous bread that comes down. That's a great way for us to think of the Eucharist. What is it? You could spend hours and days and years, your entire life, pondering the Eucharist. It's such a beautiful mystery. What is it? That's a great question. So manna was this food for the journey. 
And the Eucharist in Latin is referred to as viaticum. If you break down the Latin, it's the way you with. That Jesus is accompanying us in our journey through the desert of life. And so the manna and the image of, of the Eucharist, Jesus knows this. He knows uh, that he's the new Moses, and he wants to give us food for the journey. And so this is why when the disciples say, hey, John is teaching his disciples how to pray. How about you teach us how to pray? And Jesus says, when you pray, pray this. Our Father, who art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And the Greek there in Matthew is epiosios. I'm pronouncing that correctly. Epi means above, like an epiclesis from above, coming down. And usios means nature. So you could translate it literally as above, super, natural bread, miraculous bread. It's what man is. St. Jerome translates it as super substantial bread. But there's something of its very substance that's of God. It's, it's divine. Now they were given manna, bread, and the day. They were also given quail, flesh, in the evening. And where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. And you can translate Bethlehem as either house of bread or house of flesh. And here he gives us bread at the Last Supper and says, take this, all of you eat. This is my body. This is my flesh. So daily bread, you can think of it as a supernatural bread for the journey, and it is the Eucharist. You can't make this up. This is clearly the beautiful uh, uh, theology of what our Lord is trying to convey to us. This beautiful gift, this food for the journey. It's kept in the tabernacle. Remember I showed you that, that map and it's kept in the tabernacle as a sign of God's presence. Does that sound familiar to us? We see the tabernacle in our churches. And many Jews in the first century believe that the bread, the manna, pre-existed before the fall of humanity, before sin entered the world. And what are we told in John's gospel, those first five verses, chapters one, one uh, verses one through five, in the beginning was the word. So Jesus pre-existed and he is the bread of life, he is the man. Beautiful, 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 beautiful theology. Look at this comparison between the bread of life discourse, chapter six of John, and first Corinthians, chapter 11. The bread which I will give you and Jesus does give it to us at the Last Supper, this, hick, is my flesh, is my body, for the life of the world, that's you and that's me. So here in John's Gospel, he's making this prediction of what he's going to be giving, and then in the Eucharist itself, the words of the Last Supper, he gives it to us. Bread of the face. Remember on that graph of the temple, they had the bread of the presence, the table with the 12 cakes of bread, and that the high priest would go in and they kind of a feast, and it was uh, recommemorating when Moses and the seventy elders went up on the mountain and they got to feast with God. They got to have a meal with God. They got to gaze upon the face of God. This is called the bread of the face, or a translation could be the bread of the presence, or it could be the show bread. And so in Exodus 24, there was this heavenly banquet between the elders of the Jewish people and God. They beheld God, they saw him, and they ate and they drank. And then we have the instruction on how to build the temple. And what would happen during the time of Jesus is that the high priest would take this beautiful bread of the presence that only the priests were allowed to eat. And one time a year at Passover, they would come out to the people to the streets and they would show the bread is the presence of God. There's the face of God. And what were the words that they would say? The words they would say is, behold God's love for you. We say, Ecce on your stay. Behold the Lamb of God. The priest holds up the host. Behold, in other words, God's love for you. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, so if I believe in him, I not perish, but I have eternal life. And so this is why in John's Gospel, John the Baptist points and says, Ecce on your stay. Behold the Lamb of God. He says it twice. Look upon the face of God. And Jesus in John's Gospel says, whoever sees me sees the Father. Whoever hears me hears the Father, because the Father and I are one. And so some 70 years after the event of the death of Jesus, John's Gospel is being written, and he emphasizes that Jesus is the Lamb of God. The one who, if you gaze upon him, you're seeing the face of God. He whose body was sacrificed, and whose body you partake of by eating the blood 
uh, drinking the blood and eating the flesh, the very body, the very blood of Christ Jesus. My brothers and sisters, in John's Gospel, the Last Supper is not a Passover meal. It's not. There's a meal. There's no description of the meal. Rather, they get together to eat during the week when Jesus is about to die, and Jesus washes their feet. And then he does, and he goes and dies, and in John's Gospel, Jesus dies on the cross during the very hour when close to 300,000 lambs are being slaughtered. Because he's being sacrificed up on the cross as the new lamb whose life has been laid down for us. We don't need these hundreds of thousands of lambs anymore. He's replacing that old covenant, that sacrifice. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful theology. The takeaway is that we can't understand the Eucharist unless we come to understand that Jesus takes this beautiful covenant of God with his people and extends it to everyone. And because of his divine condescension, his incarnation, and his words that are written down in scripture, because of that, he gives us ritual. He gives us these patterns of worship. And it's based off the covenant that God had with Moses, because Jesus is the new Moses, who's given us the bread of heaven, the manna, the bread of the presence, the bread of the faith, the face of God. Uh, he is the sacrificial lamb. Uh, he has replaced himself uh, with the physical lambs that were slaughtered. I hope you've had a beautiful night. Thank you so much. I hope to see you tomorrow. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back to this third evening of this parish mission on the Jewish roots, excuse me, the scriptural roots of the uh, Eucharist. So it's great to have you guys here. Welcome to everyone. My sister came up from Little Rock. I had to bribe her just to get the numbers up. So thank you, Carrie, for that. I appreciate it. Let's begin with a prayer in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, the Paschal mystery of your death and resurrection made present in every holy mass. Pour out your healing love on your church and on our world. Grant that as we lift you up during this time of Eucharistic revival, your Holy Spirit may draw all people to join us at this banquet of life. You live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy so welcome back. Hope everyone's had a good week. Uh, here we enter into Friday night uh, for the third and final uh, session of this uh, scriptural roots of the Eucharist. There you go. I hate you so much. I hope you clap. Those are arch enemies. That's it. That's the only comedic relief I have all night. That's it. I have nothing else. There's plenty of sugar and caffeine back there. That's all. I don't have any jokes. That's the full extent all for the next 45 minutes. So just take it in, soak it in. That's, that's all you're going to get. <clears throat> Let me begin by recapping Wednesday and Thursday nights. Wednesday night, I tried to focus on the beautiful reality of God's divine or marvelous condescension, as quoted in Dave Verbum from the Second Vatican Council in 1965. That God, who is eternal, enters into the muck and the mire of our lives. How beautiful, how profound that is, and how good that we're studying that in this Christmas season, the celebration of the Incarnation. But also there's beautiful divine condescension descending down with us in Scripture itself. Because God is using Hebrew, He's using Greek. He's using language and uh, images to communicate to us. He's here reaching out to us through sacred scripture. And then God also uses ritual, habits, the liturgy, the Eucharist, because we are habitual people. We all have rituals in our lives, private or public, secular or religious, 
We are ritualistic people, and so God knows this. Of course, he created us. It's in our DNA. And so he has given to us the ritual of the liturgy of all the seven sacraments, including the Eucharist. So when we enter into the Eucharist, we are entering into an act of God who is actively at work in our lives, communicating to us, being present to us uh, in our world. Now, last night, I went into the fundamentals of the Passover event in Egypt around 1300 B.C., 1300 years before the birth of Christ. And in that tent afterwards, and in the first temple built by Solomon, and then the second temple that was built in Jerusalem and was there present during the time of Jesus, we saw that in this temple there were various ways by which God was present to his people. And so we talked about how in the very first part of the temple or the tabernacle, this is where sacrifice would happen. And when it came to the Passover, it was the sacrifice of a lamb. And Jesus Christ, of course, himself is the Paschal sacrificial lamb there at his crucifixion. And I showed you how there's evidence historically that the lambs, would have a rod put through the skin of their shoulders so they could be skinned, and then a rod going through their back end, through their neck. In a sense, they would be crucified as they were uh, prepared for the Passover feast. And Jesus, especially in John's Gospel, Jesus is the Lamb of God. <clears throat> he who is sacrificed for us once and for all. But then you go into the second venue of the, of the temple, and you have this table, and upon the table was the bread of presence, or the bread of the face. And here was the bread that the Levites, the high priests, the 70 elders, they would eat and they would drink with God. It was a banquet between humanity and with God. And of course, that's what the Eucharist is, isn't it? We get to dine with the presence of God. But then in the Holy of Holies, in this third section, we have holy man with that urn that held that miraculous heavenly bread that came down daily, daily bread, that came upon in the morning like a frost upon the grass. And when the disciples say to Jesus, teach us how to pray, Jesus says, our Father who art in heaven, give us this day our daily bread. And so Jesus is aware of all this. He's a good, faithful, righteous, first century Jew. He knew all of us. He knew that the lambs were being sacrificed for the propitiation of our sins. He knew that there was bread of the presence of God. And he knew of the holy manna, that food for the journey. And as I mentioned last night, this bread that would be eaten here at the Passover every spring during the month, the Jewish month, the, the lunar month of Nisan, they would take that bread out into the streets and they would lift it up on high. And they would say, Behold, God's love for you. And in the Mass, the priest lifts up the host and he says, Ecce agnus Dei. Behold the Lamb of God. In other words, look and gaze upon God who loves you. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son. And Jesus knew this. He knew this. For 30 plus years, he would go to Jerusalem and he would see the bread being lifted up. Behold God's love for you. And he continues then to give that to you and to me. How beautiful that is. If there's, if there's anything you take from these three nights, just take that in. That Jesus wants you to see how much he loves you through the gift of the Eucharist. So last night, I kind of ran out of time, and I quickly went through manna. So I want to pick up tonight there where we left off last night. Manna from the Hebrew means, what is it, right? Is it something mysterious that would appear every morning? It's a great way to think about the Eucharist, because it's so mysterious and beautiful and profound. For the rest of our lives, we can ponder the Eucharist and say, what is it here in our midst? Manna for 40 years in the desert was food for the journey. And sometimes we call the Eucharist the Atuku. It is food that goes with you along the way of the journey of life. And in the Lord's Prayer, in Matthew, it says, Give us this day our daily bread. And if you think about it, that's a little redundant, isn't it? Give us this day our daily bread. Uh, you're repeating the same thing twice. It's a bit redundant. But if you look at the original Greek, 
It's give us this day our epibusios. Epi means above, and busios means nature, like homoousios, right? The nature of Jesus Christ, homoousios, one nature. And so it's epi above. And so a literal translation is give us this day our super above, super natural bread. Or St. Jerome in the year 400 says, give us this day our super substantial bread. Meaning there is something that we are asking for. Jesus taught us a way to pray by which we would be given a bread that isn't wonder bread or oat bread, but it's bread that is above nature. It's something supernatural. It's something that is food for the journey. He knew all this when he was teaching us how to pray. And this leads eventually into the Passover, and eventually leads into the Eucharist. Manna was given during the daytime, quail, flesh, meats was given in the evening. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And Bethlehem is a city, the name can be translated as the place of bread, or it can be translated as the place of flesh. How appropriate. And he's born in a manger. What's a manger for? It's where the animals would come and eat and to be sustained. And so Jesus is the bread, he is the flesh for the life of the world. Manna, as I showed you earlier, was kept here in the Holy of Holies as a sign of God's presence for us. And so we too also have the Eucharist, the Eucharistic bread, the host, the body and blood of Christ in the tabernacle in our churches. It was also believed in the first century that the manna that came down each morning like dew frost on the grass was before time existed, that it existed in heaven, it would come down directly from heaven, it was heavenly food. And what is Jesus in John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5? He is the Word in the beginning, before time existed itself, and He has come down to us. So Jesus Himself is the manna that pre-exists time and space, who has come down to earth to nourish us. So let's look now at John chapter 6, because it's here in John chapter 6, the Eucharistic uh, Bread of Life discourse, where Jesus explains this connection between himself and holy manna. Amen, amen, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the desert, so 1,300 years before Christ. They died. This is the bread that comes down from heaven so that one may eat it and not die. I, Jesus, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever, and the bread that I will give is my flesh for the life of the world. And the Jews quarreled among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? That is a really, really good question. I would have asked the exact same question if I was there in the first century listening to this. Because to me, it sounds like cannibalism. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So they're interpreting this line by Jesus on a very literal level. He wants us to eat his flesh as cannibalism. That's kind of the pagans do that. That's, that's horrendous. This makes me sick to my stomach. So that's how they're interpreting it on a very literal level. And Jesus says to them, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood... And that, again, would have been very taboo for Jewish first century Jews, sick to the stomach, to drink a man's blood. If you don't do this, you do not have life within you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. So Jesus doesn't back down. Notice he doesn't back down. He doesn't say, oh, no, 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 I'm just kidding. Sorry, that was a mistake. I, I misspoke. He doesn't do that. He doubles down. He keeps going. He keeps emphasizing. You have to eat my flesh. You have to drink my blood. For my flesh is true food as opposed to false food. And my blood is true drink as opposed to false drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I have life because of the Father, so also the one who feeds on me will have life because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, unlike your ancestors who ate and still died. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. So here in John chapter 6, Jesus is making it very clear that he is a new type of manna. He's a new type of bread that will come to you daily. And 
And if you commune with him, if you eat of this bread, which is his flesh, and if you drink of his blood, you will have eternal life. Just as the Jewish Hebrews were able to have life for 40 years as they wandered through the desert. And we're going to see later that we're not supposed to interpret this literally. Of course not. It's not cannibalism. It's not drinking physical blood. But we're going to see that nevertheless, it's very much very real the body and blood of Christ. So we'll, we'll get to that here in a little bit. But at the point, at this point right now, the focus here is that Jesus is the new manna who is given to us as food for the journey. I showed you last night that there's a great parallel between John chapter 6 and 1 Corinthians chapter 11. The bread which I will give He's at John 6, toward the beginning of his ministry, eventually he's going to die at the Passover. This is my flesh, is my body. You see the parallels for the life of who? The life of the world, which is for you. So it's very clear that in John chapter 6, Jesus is conveying that his life is going to be communicated to you through the Last Supper ritual, which is the Eucharist. Very clear. Okay. Now, what I didn't get to last night is the fourth cup, the blood, the wine. Remember I mentioned to you here that you have this table, that you have the 12 cakes of bread. You also had glasses of wine on this table. And so that in Exodus 24, Moses and the elders went up onto the mountaintop and they saw God and they dined with God. They had bread and they had wine, they had a banquet, they had a feast. And so here on this table in the temple would have been the bread, but also the wine. And so we want to understand better, what does Jesus mean by drinking his blood? We've seen him talk about his body, we've seen him talk about the bread, and especially in John 6, but what about his blood? A book that I recommended last night is by Brent Petrie, Jesus and the Jewish Roots of the Eucharist, highly, highly recommend. He also talks about the fourth cup of the Passover meal, but so too does Dr. Scott Hahn, has an entire book just on the fourth cup. Very accessible, very beautiful, highly recommend uh, this book for you. So in the first century, during the time of Jesus, there would have been, during the Passover meal, four cups of wine. And it would have been real wine, like red wine. And unlike my parents who drink this kind of like fruity, sweet, uh, Moscato wine. I don't, I don't do it. The only time they drink real actual red wine is when I'm home when we celebrate mass at the kitchen table. I get them to actually drink actual red wine, Cabernet Sauvignon. Or anyway. So they would have had red, real wine here at the Passover. And there would have been four cups. The first cup would have been the cup of sanctification, or the Kaddush in Hebrew. The second cup would have been a cup of proclamation, the Haggadah cup. The third cup, which is especially important for us, is the cup of blessing, the Barakah. When the priest says Mass, and the server brings over the bread and the wine, and we set it on the altar, the priest says, Blessed are you. Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we receive the bread we offer you. That blessed are you is Barakah. So it's straight from the Jewish Passover meal. You take the cup of wine, the chalice, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we receive the wine we offer you. Through the wine work of your hands we come for us, it's our spiritual drink, that is the Barakah blessing. Straight from this Passover meal. You then pause and you sing hymns of praise from Psalms 115 through 118, and then you drink the fourth cup of wine, the cup of praise, the halal, and that completes, it brings to completion the Passover meal. So this is crucial, what our Lord is doing here. It's so very powerful, very beautiful. In Luke chapter 22, verses 17 through 20, he says this. Then Jesus took a cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I tell you that from this time on I shall not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took the bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which will be given for you. Do this in memory of me. 
brings the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood which will be shed for you. So in Luke, we have here a first cup, we then have bread, and then we have a second cup. And scholars in our tradition says that that first cup here in Luke, that that is the cup of proclamation. He then has the second cup, and that is the cup of in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, right, the earliest account of the Last Supper, Paul says the cup of blessing which we bless, is it not participation in the blood of Christ? What's the cup of blessing? It's the third one there. It's the barakah. Blessed are you, Lord God of all creation. It's the same cup, the second cup that Luke mentions. Right? So Jesus at the Last Supper takes this cup, he then has bread, he takes the third cup. Notice there's no mention of a fourth cup, is there? There's no mention of a fourth cup. But then, what happens immediately after the Last Supper? In the Synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, Jesus and the Apostles go to the Garden of Gethsemane. On the way to the Garden of Gethsemane, what do they do? They sing it. So you see it's the hymn of Psalms 115 through 118. So according to Luke, it mentions the second cup, it mentions the third cup, Paul mentions the third cup, and then they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and as they do, they sing the hymns. Still, there's no fourth cup. This is really profound, really beautiful. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus says, My Father, God the Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What is the cup he's referring to here? Surely it must then be the fourth cup, the cup of praise. Now in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, go up to Jesus and they say, Hey, can we sit on your left and on your right in glory in your kingdom? And Jesus says, you have no clue what you're asking, do you? And they're basically like, no, we don't really know what we're talking about. We just want glory and power. And Jesus says, can you drink the cup that I'm going to drink? Can you be baptized in the baptism by which I will be baptized? And James and John are kind of silent. They don't really know what they're saying. So you can think about the cup that Jesus has to drink, or the baptism by which he's going to be baptized, as a metaphor, as an image for his suffering, his passion, and his death, right? I tell my students, your cup that you have to drink is my final exam. <laughs> you gotta get through it, right? Oh, I wish I didn't have to take this final exam, but I have to, have to drink the cup. It's the bitter cup of your fate. You have to get through it. So when James and John ask that question, Jesus says, can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? Many, it's the, his bitter passion and his death. As an aside, in Mark's Gospel, it's James and John who ask that embarrassing question. Can we be on your left and your right? Can we have glory? And the other apostles, you know, make fun of them like, oh, what an embarrassing question. You know? In Matthew, he changes it. <laughs> in Matthew's Gospel, it's the mother of James and John who asks that embarrassing question. Can my son sit on your left and your right? So when I go to heaven, hopefully when I go to heaven, I can't wait to meet the mother of James and John because for 2,000 years she has been blamed. She's been thrown under the bus for asking this embarrassing question that according to Mark, her sons uh, asked her. But the point here is that in the Gospels, this idea of a cup is a bitter passion, a suffering you must endure. But here in this context, the cup is after the Passover meal, it's after the second cup, it's after the third cup, it's after the hymns. But Jesus has yet to literally actually drink from a cup of wine. And he's referring to this cup. Do I have to drink of it? So this is a clue for us, isn't it? That this cup, this fourth cup that he has to drink, is a cup of his suffering and his death. So he's on the cross, he's suffering. And according to Mark 14, Matthew 26, it says that they took a sponge, they filled it with sour wine, and they put it on a reed and they gave it to him to drink and to drink. According to John, it's very direct. 
Jesus cries out, I thirst. And a bowl full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of wine on hyssop. And how did Moses in Exodus sprinkle the people with the old covenant, the blood, the branch of hyssop? And so Jesus says, I thirst, and he took wine and placed from hyssop, and they held it to his mouth. And when he had drunk the wine, he says, consumatumest. It's consummated. It's finished. And you look at that passage and you think, well, of course it's finished. He's done. Good job. He's, he's done what he came to do. But the question really is, what, is it, what does he mean by it is finished? Well, by drinking of that wine on the cross, he has consumed the fourth cup. So the it that is finished is the Passover meal. So what our Lord is doing here is that you have this Passover meal and the next day you have his death. And he doesn't finish the meal the night before. He only drinks three cups. Then he goes into the garden and sings hymns. And he asks in a prayer that the cup be taken from him, but it's not, because he's willing, he's obedient to die. And it's here on his cross, on the crucifix, that he drinks the fourth cup. So what he does is he turns the Passover meal into a sacrifice. And he turns the sacrifice into a commemorative meal. It's so very important that we understand that when we celebrate Mass, we are celebrating a meal, but we're also celebrating a sacrifice. It's not just a commemorative meal to remember a really great, amazing event that happened 2,000 years ago. It is the representation of the sacrifice of Christ. In an unbloody manner, there's no blood being spilled at Mass, unless my homily goes really long and people start throwing knives at me. There's no blood being spilled. But it is the presence of Jesus Christ, his, his death, present in the Eucharist, in the bread and wine. Isn't that beautiful? Okay. So, what I want to talk about then is this Paschal mystery. The Paschal mystery, Jesus is the manna, the bread, the food for the journey. It is his true flesh. Jesus drinks the blood on the cross. He completes the Pass Passover meal. He has laid down his life. He is the true lamb, as we hear in John's Gospel. Ecce on your stage, John the Baptist points. Ecce, behold, look, the lamb of God. Jesus in John's Gospel is sacrificed from the cross at the very hour when over 300,000 lambs are being bled out and being crucified on the other side of Jerusalem. He is the one who's bringing to fulfillment the Jewish Passover. And so we want to talk about the Paschal mystery. Because my brothers and sisters, this is the heart of what we're doing every time we celebrate the Mass, every time we celebrate the Eucharist, especially at Easter time, but every single day throughout the year. So when we talk about the Paschal mystery, we have to talk about the word mystery itself, the Paschal mystery. Mystery comes from the Greek mysterion. And in mystery, we don't mean Sherlock Holmes' mystery, who done it. We're playing a game of Clue, it was uh, Professor Plum in the library with the candlestick. Rather, it's mystery, meaning it's something that's so profound that you and I can't fully understand it. Right? It's like that beautiful icon of the hand of God coming out of the clouds. The clouds represent there's a mystery, there's something divine that's beyond us that we can't fully understand. But bit by bit, we try to come out and understand it. St. Paul uses the word mysterion throughout his writings. He says that he's a steward of the mysteries. I mean, he's just here to pro proclaim the, the, the mystery of God, that God so loved the world, that God would, would reconcile us. All these beautiful, profound moments in the life of Jesus. So that's what it means, a mystery, something that's beyond our understanding, but bit by bit it's being revealed to us. Eventually, in the first, second, third, fourth centuries, the Greek language fades away because the Roman Empire takes precedence, and so the language of the day isn't Greek, the language of the day now is Latin. 
So when you go to Mass, sometimes the priest or the choir will say, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. That's Greek. Because it's the last remnants of our Greek liturgy that was eventually replaced by Latin. And so the Latin term that was used to replace the Greek mysterion was a sacramentum. A sacramentum in ancient Rome would have been an oath or a tattoo that a Roman soldier received. Because the Roman soldier, or recruit, was going to sign up to be a soldier in the Roman army, and he had in his heart courage, he had in his heart a willingness to obey his commanding officer, he had a willingness to lay down his life for the fatherland, for the Roman Empire, and those things were real. His courage was real, his willingness to obey was real, his willingness to die was real. You can't see it, so he would take an oath. Or he would have a tattoo branded on his arm to be an outward sign of an invisible reality. Just because something is invisible doesn't mean it's real. His courage was real. His obedience was, was real. But he says an oath that you can hear. He has a tattoo that you can see. It was a visible sign of his interior invisible reality. And so the early church said, that's amazing. Because that's really much what baptism is. That you're a new creation, you've died to your old way, you can't necessarily see that, but, but the sacrament is an outward sign of that interior disposition to convert and to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. So a sacrament is this outward, visible sign of an inward and invisible grace of reality. Pope St. Leo the Great famously said in his 74th sermon, what was visible in Jesus has passed over into his mystery. So what does that mean? Well, what was visible in our Savior? What are the mysteries? The mysteries are sacraments, baptism. Oh, Jesus was baptized. That was a life of his part of his life. Oh, Matthew 28, Jesus says, Go to all the nations, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus said, Take this all of you and eat, take this all of you and drink, do this in remembrance of me. That was part of that was part of his life. Oh, Jesus forgave sinners, and he said, Go and sin no more. That's like reconciliation. So all of these mysteries of the life of Jesus uh, that were visible, all these events in the life of Jesus, they passed over into his sacraments, into his mysteries. And for our topic tonight, the, the Eucharist, the Greek word pascha is very much related to the Hebrew word for Passover, which is Pesach. And so we talk about the Paschal mystery, or the Passover mystery. Or you could say the, the, the wonder, the awe of, of, the, of, the, of the death and resurrection. I was told that I had ugly handwriting last week, and I think they were honest. I think they were being true. That's uh, not very good. But with Paschal Mystery, you can think of the awe, the wonder, the amazement of the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's the Paschal mystery. That's at the heart of what we're celebrating every time we celebrate the Mass. Let's fast forward to St. Pope Paul VI. He wrote after the Second Vatican Council that the Paschal mystery celebration is of supreme importance in Christian worship. As we are clearly taught by the sacred Second Vatican Council, and its meaning is unfolded over the course of days and weeks of the whole year. Meaning that the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, that mystery, is revealed to us each and every single day, every week, and every day. So we celebrate Advent, we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate Lent, we celebrate Easter, we celebrate ordinary time, we celebrate Christian other saints, we celebrate the ascension of our Lord, we celebrate Pentecost. What all of these feast days are trying to do is to remind us of the Paschal mystery, the death and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, which was consummated in the Last Supper and in his death. That's why the Eucharist is so important, because that's the heart. It's at the heart of Christianity. So let's look at a few prefaces. I have three prefaces. This is a prayer that the priest prays at the beginning of the Eucharistic prayer. This is the preface you can pray at Easter Sunday during the season of Easter. It is truly right and just in the salvation of Passover to lodge you, God, more gloriously when Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Jesus is the Lamb who's been sacrificed for us. And 
Jesus is made present in the Eucharist. He's the true lamb, right? What do you mean true lamb as opposed to false lambs? In the first century, when Jesus is killed, there are 300,000 lambs being sacrificed. Wonderful, beautiful, that's of God. But it's not the true lamb, Jesus Christ, who was crucified on the cross, you see? Who has taken away the sins of the world by dying, he's destroyed our death, by rising, he has restored our life, and therefore we're overcome with paschal joy. What is paschal joy? It's to be amazed that God so loved the world that he came into this world to die for the likes of little old me and you. The paschal joy, the death and the resurrection, that sin and death no longer has claim over us. Preface one, for any Sunday in ordinary time. For through his paschal mystery, his death and resurrection, Jesus accomplished the marvelous deed by which he has freed us from the yoke of sin and death, summoning us to the glory of being now called a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for your own possession. To proclaim everywhere your mighty works, you have called us out of darkness into your own marvelous light. That beautiful. Every time we celebrate the Eucharist, that's what's happening. Preface 6 of Sunday's Ordinary Time. For in you we live and move and have our being, and while in this body we not only experience the daily effects of God's care, but even now possess the pledge of life eternal. For having received the first fruits of the Spirit, through whom you raised up Jesus from the dead, we hope for an everlasting share in the Paschal mystery. So in the first Pent in the first Passover in Egypt, 1,300 years before Christ, they got to share in the Paschal mystery because God's angel of death passed over the homes of those faithful Hebrews who had sacrificed a lamb and put the, the blood over the doorposts. But now we, who believe in Christ Jesus, we get to share in the Paschal mystery because Jesus is that lamb whose blood has been slain and by which we pass from this life into the next. So that's what it's all about. Every time we celebrate the Eucharist, we are participating in the very life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He who is the true lamb, he who has given us of his very flesh to eat, his very blood to drink, it is manna. He who gives us a ritual by which you hear each day or each Sunday, behold the Lamb of God, behold God's love for you, just as Jesus, as a boy, as a young man, as a 33-year-old, would see the high priest doing every spring in the month of Nisan at Passover. Okay. You guys with me? This is too, okay. All right. Let's talk about the real presence. The real presence. The reason we're having a Eucharistic revival is because there was a very startling survey uh, that was conducted by CARA. CARA is based out of Georgetown in D.C. It's the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate. And they found that only 31% say that they believe that during Mass, the bread and wine actually becomes the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And the bishops began to worry. That's such a low number, 31%. Uh, my friends at the Notre Dame Center for Liturgy did their own survey, and they, they redid the wording, and the, and the, the number went above 31%. And, and really, when, when you look at 31%, maybe it's so low because people don't quite understand what we mean by the real presence. So I want to spend uh, our final minutes tonight talking about what we mean by the real presence uh, for the past 2,000 years in our faith. On the one hand, you have an extreme of sacramental realism. And I hope this joke doesn't uh, offend you guys. But uh, Father Schober was not sure whether he really should have bought the new crucifix at Ikea. Because now he has to build it himself. He has to draw the nails into the hands uh, of Jesus. So now he's, he's second guessing. We do not believe in a sacramental realism. That's an extreme belief. That the presence of Jesus is it's not a physical presence, as if his bones and muscles and sinews are present in the host. Because the physical body of Jesus Christ resides in heaven. He ascended uh, into heaven. So when we talk about sacramental realism, that's very much a, a, a very extreme position that we Catholics do not believe in. Now you might say, now wait a minute, Father Michael, what about Eucharistic miracles? 
You see the photo there on the top right. And there are all these beautiful, amazing stories the past 2,000 years where a priest is celebrating Mass and the host begins to bleed. Uh, the, the bread of the host begins to look like actual muscle tissue that you can look under a microscope and you can take the DNA out and you can examine it. Absolutely, that has happened. The most famous was in the 1200s at Orvieto. A very pious priest was celebrating Mass. He was very pious, very prayerful, but he was having a hard time believing that this was really the body and blood of Jesus Christ. And as he was celebrating Mass, he noticed that there's all this blood on the corporal, the, the cloth there that you have the host and the chalice resting upon. And he takes this, this uh, Eucharist, and he takes this corporal uh, linen, he takes it to the nearby town of Orvieto, uh, to Pope Urban IV, was it? And Pope Urban IV sees it, you can see here this beautiful painting in the bottom left, you can see the Pope kneeling as the other bishop holds up the cloth showing the blood. And it's because of that that the solemnity of Corpus Christi was, uh, was installed, and we celebrate that every year. And it was St. Thomas Aquinas who encouraged the Pope to have a feast day just to celebrate the very body and the very blood of Jesus Christ. So why do these, why do these miracles happen? They happen, not because they're normal, they're not normative, right? I said Mass earlier today at 9 a.m. at the parish, there was no actual physical body and blood there on the altar. But if these the events happen because it's an extraordinary ways to reveal to us and remind us that yes, it is very much the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. But we're not consuming literally, physically the body and blood of Christ, uh, just as we saw in John 6, right? John 6, Jesus says, this is my flesh, this is my blood. I'm like, oh, you're a cannibal. And then Jesus stands back down. He gives us his very body, he gives us his very uh, blood, but he does so under the guise, through the means of the instruments of bread and wine. Some people say, well, you know, the Eucharist is just a symbol. Oh, that's just a gesture. You know, it's a nice thing to do occasionally on Sundays, maybe the first Sunday of the month. Oh, it's just a remembrance meal to remember something. We have to, we have to uh, reject that. First of all, a symbol is not a mere symbol, right? We said, oh, that's just a, that's a mere symbol, it doesn't really matter. No, 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 symbols matter. Symbol comes from sim, and if I'm spelling this correctly, bolin in the Greek, and that means to throw, and this means together. And so it's taking Daniel's love and Lisa's love and it's throwing them together. It's very real. It's not fake, it's not a mere symbol, it's very real. And so the Eucharist is a symbol, it's a very real symbol of God's presence with us. So you should never think of the Eucharist as merely a symbol. No, no, it's very rich, it's very much a real symbol. It's not just a simple gesture, it is the means that Christ gave us at the Last Supper to be present with him. Do this in memory of me. He says, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And some Christians say, well, it's just a mere remembrance meal. It's a reminder for us. But I mentioned that last time that for the Jewish people and for us Christians, memory, there are two types of memory. There's a very shallow memory. Hey, remember that event? Remember Pearl Harbor? Oh, I remember that. I read about that. Oh, yeah, I was there. Right? But then there's like a deep memory where an event is made present to you. So when we talk about the Eucharist as a remembrance meal, it's not just looking at old photos of something that happened over 2,000 years ago, Jesus got together and had a really special meal. No, it's far more than that. So let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 17 through 34. And giving this instruction, I do not praise the fact that your meetings are doing more harm than good. My favorite line in Paul's writings, it's so scandalous. The Corinthians, when they get together on Sunday mornings to worship, doing more harm than good. What a great excuse not to go to church on Sunday morning. Oh, I'm trying to sleep in, does more harm than good. Because they had all these divisions. They were getting together and they were fighting. There were some Christians who were very rich, and they were getting together having filet mignon and cabernet sauvignon, and other Christians who were very poor, and they were eating bread scraps and dirty water. 
And so Paul says, your divisions are doing more harm than good. I hear that when you meet, there are divisions. And there are factions among you. And when you meet in one place, then it is not to eat the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own supper. One goes hungry. Another one gets drunk. Do you not have houses in which you can eat and drink? Therefore, the solution is, when you come together to eat, wait for one another. And if you're actually hungry, go home. So what, Paul, so what Paul is doing here is he's making a distinction between an ordinary meal, right, and the Eucharist. So when we gather to celebrate the Eucharist, it's not an ordinary meal. It's not just a memorial meal, some event that happened long ago. It's something mystical, something mysterious. Something that's different than just your ordinary eating and drinking in life. Sacramental magic. Some people say, oh, I just go there and I can automatically get God's graces. There's truth to this, but we have to be careful. Uh, even uh, I, a great sinner, I can say Mass here at the parish, and as long as I intend to celebrate the Eucharist as the Church intends, even if I'm a notorious, awful sinner, it's still going to become the body and blood of Christ, right? Thank goodness, right? Uh, you'd have to be looking up, you have to call the parish every Sunday morning. Who's celebrating Mass? Is it Father uh, Angelic Father or is it Father Michael the Sinner? Oh, it's Father Michael the Sinner, the individual Mass, right? So it doesn't matter who the priest is, as long as he's doing what the church intends, it is the Mass and it is the Eucharist. This is Lake Como in Italy, northern Italy. I was there for a weekend and I had dear friends who had money and they were paying for everything. And you can sit here, you can't really see it, but there was a button, and it says bar. And then it said in Italian, servizio. And you push the little button, and out came a little waiter in a white tuxedo, and he would take your drink order. It was great. And you just keep pushing that little button, and out he would come, and he would bring all the drinks, and someone else was paying for it. It was magical. It was delightful. Sometimes we can think of the Eucharist like that. Well, I show up to Mass, and I sit there, and I get through Father Michael's homily, and then I receive the host, and cha-ching, I'm done. But we have to understand that that's a pretty shallow understanding. That the Mass requires God's presence, which is always present. But it also requires us to be men and women of faith, who prepare ourselves to celebrate well the sacrament. People who have gone to confession, especially if we have serious sin, who have built a relationship with God through prayer, who have learned not just to love God in prayer, but to love God by giving charity to our neighbors, that the sacrament isn't just a magic. So let me end here with uh, two final slides. I began by talking about divine condescension. It's marvelous that God comes to our level. In the incarnation that God took on our flesh, and he suffered along with us, even to experience death, that God uses language, the Hebrew language, of the Greek language, of Latin, of English, to convey himself to us, and then he gives us rituals to communicate his divine life to us, including the gift of the Eucharist. How beautiful that is. That right there is enough to ponder for the next five years, right? That's just so amazing right there and then. But what I also want to leave you with is that just as there was this divine condescension of God coming to our level, our calling as the baptized is to have this marvelous ascension. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. It's the lifting up of your hearts, right? It's the sorsum corda, but lifting up your hearts. And so we can imitate the incarnation of Jesus by imitating him, by lifting up our small little individualistic, sinful, egotistical hearts, and learning to love as Christ Jesus loved. That's how we can respond. Sacred Scripture is God's Word coming down to us, but for you and me to bear witness to the goodness of God, both by our words and our actions, what a beautiful response that is. And then Christ has given us this ritual, this new covenant, this Passover, by which we can be present to Him and He can be present to us. But that only occurs if we are there with him to be present at the Eucharist, to be present in the assembly, to build up the parish life, to build up the community. So as we marvel at the marvelous condescension of God, may we also um, rededicate ourselves to a marvelous ascension.
in response back to that. Thank you so very, very much to everyone, especially the committee who put together the uh, refreshments, to Todd and others who helped with the uh, audio-visual, to everyone who donated to this beautiful Parish Life Center. Thank you very much, and may God bless you. Thank you. There was a question about Q&A. So do we have a few pointed questions? I won't have the answer now. I'll have the answer later when I'm about to go to bed. Oh my God. So we'll take a few minutes here just for Q&A. Does anyone have a question? Yes, Dr. Bob. So the question is, if, if, uh, if it's not a physical presence of bone and muscle and sinew and, and DNA, then, then what is it? It's, it is a presence. We would say it's a sacramental presence. So it, it is the body and blood, right? So we, we believe in the body, blood, soul, and divinity that, that Jesus is present in the Eucharist. But again, God meets us where we're at. So he's not going to have us eat actual physical flesh or actual physical blood, that would be cannibalism. And especially first century Judaism, I mean, it was, it, was a, it, was a, it was a tremendous taboo to drink any blood of any animal, especially a human being. So when, when, we, when we celebrate the Eucharist, we're doing it in a, in, in, with a means that you and I can, can enter into. So bread and wine, which for human history, those are staples, or the basics of life. Good bottle of wine, a good a loaf of bread. Uh, it, it's a wonderful life where they build a new house for this family. They say, A loaf of bread that you may never go hungry, and a bottle of wine that you may have cheer and joy. Right? Bread and wine is at, is at the heart of a human sustenance. So we believe that it is the body and blood of Christ, but, but the, 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 the form that we encounter it's, it's food and drink, it's, it's bread and it's, it's, it's wine. So uh, this is why, again, we have, from time to time in our, in our history, we have these moments where the host does have, becomes human tissue, it becomes human blood, and, but that's extraordinary, and it's meant to be moments to remind us, like, hey, just so you know, this is, this is real. But the actual form that you're receiving on an ordinary basis each day, day in and day out, it's, it's a sacramental presence. Meaning, what you, the visible sign that you see is bread and wine, but the invisible reality is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Yeah. Great question. Great clarification. Other questions? Yes. Yeah, great question. So they, and that's Exodus 25. So this is after the Exodus out of slavery, out of Egypt. And uh, Moses uh, creates, God creates through Moses a new covenant. He sprinkles the people with blood. Like now they're part of God's family. And then Moses and Aaron and some of the elders, they have a feast with God up on the mountaintop. Right? So this becomes the bread of the presence of the bread of the face. So they get to eat with God. And it says that they saw God. Now, when Moses is a shepherd and he first encounters God, God appears to him as a burning bush. And Moses is instructed to take his shoes off because this is holy ground. And no one can gaze upon the face of God because if you gaze upon the face of God, you're just struck dumb and you're struck dead because of the, the pure brilliance of God. No human being can fully comprehend the mystery and the presence of, of God. So in that verse, it does say that they, they saw God. So it's a great question. One way to interpret that is to just think that they don't physically see God, like I see you right now, but rather it's a poetic way of saying they came to know God, right? 
Like, have you ever heard someone who says, uh, gosh, no one in my place of work really listens to me. No one sees me, right? Or you might be in a marriage therapy, and they'll say, my, my spouse never, they never seem to see me, right? They don't appreciate me. It's that they don't, there's no real connection. So one way to think about that is, is it's more of a poetic, beautiful way of saying that they got to have an encounter with God. They got to see him. They got to be in God's presence. So that, that's, one way, that's one way of thinking about it. But the big takeaway is that in, the, in that Hebrew context, but also especially in the context of Jesus and Luke's gospel, to eat with someone in the first century as a Jewish person was an act of intimacy. Right? Like, you might go to the mall, and you go to the food court, and you're just like, oh, it's so crowded, I'm just going to, can I sit here? Is it okay? Like, you wouldn't do that in the first century, because to, to randomly sit here means now we're, we're having intimacy. We're friends, and we agree with one another, and you, so you don't just eat with anyone. You, you're very particular about who you sit down with. So for them to dine together, is, it's a sign of, of intimacy. So I think that's one way to interpret that is that they saw God, it's, it's a poetic, beautiful way of saying they, they got to really see face-to-face -face and come to know who God is. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, Joseph. So one of the one time I would preach somebody doesn't have stretch. And so I've always used that as, as a way to kind of teach them remembrance. It happens. But it's said that Yeah, so Joseph's question was about how in the Mass, the priest consecrates the bread, who becomes the body of Christ, and consecrates the wine, who becomes the blood of Christ. But at the fraction rite, he commingles a particle of the host uh, in the chalice, which is the blood. Uh, and so the consecration represents his death, and then commingling represents he's coming together uh, as his resurrection. So when it comes to the spirituality of the Mass, there are different ways to interpret all the different parts. Uh, usually there's a practical reason why things are done, and sometimes there's then a spiritual reason. So for example, uh, the priest will uh, take a little bit of water and he'll pour it into the chalice, right? And he'll say, by the mystery of this water and wine, when we come to share in the divinity of Christ, we have a little something to share in our humanity. Uh, the practical reason is because for centuries, the wine would be way too strong. And so you would cut it with water. And actually in the Jewish Passover, you would mingle water in the wine with the first cup, right? So your family can afford maybe a keg of wine every few months, and you want to make it last, so you're going to cut it with water, right? Kind of weaken it to make it last longer. The, so, that, so the church would do that in the first few centuries. We keep doing that, not because the wine at Mass is too strong, but because it's this beautiful spirituality of the humanity of Jesus, plain old water, and the wine, right, which is rich, which represents his divinity. So that's a great example of where they first did that for practical reasons, and then they did it for spiritual reasons. So the, the commingling, there are all sorts of different spiritual translate, uh, explanations of why you do that. And the one you explained is, is one of them, which is very beautiful and very, very legitimate. Um, you know, there's, it's similar to the, the priest who celebrates Mass. I have to receive both the body and the blood, or the Mass isn't uh, valid. Um, so so that's, uh, that's, that's related. So it, it would be more of, of a beautiful way to interpret the spirituality of it. Yeah. Okay, we have one more, and then we'll run it. Yes. Right. So the question here is about timing, because in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it never mentions anything about eating a lamb. Um, and the theology is that Jesus himself is, uh, is the lamb. 
me see if I have that slide. Yes. So basically, in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, Jesus' Last Supper is a Passover meal. So the lambs have been sacrificed in the temple. And one of the disciples went and picked one up and brought it to the Last Supper. But there's no mention of it. Because Jesus doesn't want to talk about the lamb because he's the lamb. Now, that's written in the year 70, the year 85. By the time you get to the year 100, John's writing his gospel. He changes the timeline. And for John's gospel, it seems that the Last Supper is not a Passover meal. It's just a meal. Got to eat. So Jesus and the disciples get together. It just happens to be the Last Supper that they have together. So that when uh, people are getting preparing for the Passover, and they're slaughtering 300,000 plus lambs. In John's gospel, Jesus, the Lamb of God, is being slaughtered. So it really, it's, it's, a, it's, uh, it's very complex. It's a great puzzle for scripture scholars. But, but most people believe that in Mark, Matthew, and Luke, the, Passover, the Last Supper is a Passover meal. The Lamb is there. But Jesus doesn't talk about it because he's the Lamb. And John takes that further, and he makes the Last Supper to be this just a random meal talks about feet washing, because it's when Jesus is on the cross, that's when across the city of Jerusalem, thousands of lambs are being sacrificed, to emphasize that he is the Lamb of God. Guys, thank you so much. God bless you. Have a blessed rest of the Christmas season.